I'd like to call to order the City of Bothell Planning Commission tonight is Wednesday, May the 3rd at 6 p.m. 2017. And all commissioners are here and accounted for with the exception of Commissioner Hampton who is on his way. It's a busy night. Uh, thanks for everybody for getting here at six o'clock from downtown Seattle, that is. It's a long way. Um, I guess are, are there, uh, th this is a chance for um, any non-agenda public comments. If there are any uh, non-agenda public comments, not referring to anything we have on the agenda tonight, uh, please come forward and state your name and uh, you have up to three minutes. No non no non-agenda public comments this evening and no minutes to approve new business. Okay, with that, we'll just go ahead and move back into the, uh, we'll continue the public hearing regarding code amendments to implement a clustering mechanism within the Bothell Municipal Code. This is the fourth and final public hearing on the topic. Good evening, Chair and members of the Commission, members of the public. As you identified, this is the fourth Planning Commission public hearing on this topic. Uh, and essentially the purpose of tonight is to brief the Commission on the third draft of potential code amendments related to the tree retention and clustering. These are some draft provisions that were provided prior to the April meeting, which was uh, continued. And those changes are within three chapters of the code, 1102 definitions, 1218 tree retention and landscaping, that's basically the tree retention provisions, and 1230, the planned unit development, or PUD, which is where the new clustering subdivision process is located. And of course, tonight, the commission can certainly ask questions of staff. We uh, will, of course, receive public testimony. And tonight, the recommendation would be to close the public hearing, deliberate on the plan and code amendments, as well as the draft planning commission findings, and finalize your recommendation. Now within the tree retention provisions, what we did is that as development review staff sat down and we identified one of the things that was kind of kind of some issues and that was the order of the way that was uh, basically laid out. And that essentially was because there was different provisions talking about the same thing within different locations within that, within that chapter. So what we've done is we've actually proposed to reorder the language in a little bit more logical manner that kind of duplicates some of our other provisions. Uh, for instance, relocate the applicability language, the exception language, uh, clarify the tree retention plan requirements, basically how it would have to be submitted with the development, clarify the type of perimeter treatment that must retain trees, and what we're recommending is a wider type one or two landscape treatment. Uh, basically, the type three landscape treatment is only five feet wide, and you can very rarely fit a large, uh, significant tree within that type of an area. This also implements a new tree diameter inches retention standard of 15%. The current regulation is 10%. Uh, and that would be of the site's total diameter inches within the net buildable area. In other words, trees within critical areas and critical area buffers would no longer be counted toward the uh, tree retention provisions. We've also got some uh, provisions that clarify the criteria that is gonna use when you evaluate the trees that will be retained. Basically, we kind of took those things again that were in the code, kind of reordered them, kind of clarified them a little bit. And that was at partly a, uh, we have in the packet a decision from the hearing examiner on a project that we provide to the commission. And it kind of helped, looking at that decision helped us understand where the issues were for both applicants, staff, and of course the hearing examiner. Finally, uh, there's some provisions within this chapter that allow developments within areas designated as compact urban neighbors, neighborhoods, which is basically the residential activity centers, to use an alternative tree retention practice. And this is where we'd allow smaller trees, for example, to be credited toward the uh, significant tree retention provisions. The provisions within the cluster deputy, or section 1230, are not quite as extensive. And essentially what we did is, again, we clarified the amount of lot area and lot circle reduction within each zone. In other words, it's 50% for the R96, R84, R7200, and R5100D, and 60% for R40,000. That's exactly the same as what's in the Fitzgerald provisions. So we again, our, our part of our charge was trying to duplicate some of those provisions, and that's basically what we wanted to do there. 
We've limited the rounding up incentive to small developments of between four to nine lots. And that's a, that's a little bit different. Originally we were talking about the rounding up would be applied basically whenever it was. And I know that the commission identified, well, maybe we should limit that to a higher number than just two. So basically our recommendation is to go to four to nine. We've also clarified some of the provisions on building coverage and the type of open space that would be within the clustered area that's dedicated for preservation. Forest lands, forest equivalent surface water facilities, preservation of existing trees and other types of open space that we want to provide. Finally, we have a provision that requires that those lands be placed into a separate permanent open space tract that's not available for future de development. And that was, an, again, a real key feature of what we want to achieve here. Um, of course, tonight you have some draft Planning Commission findings, conclusions, and recommendation, which recaps the Planning Commission process, some of the deliberations the Commission has already held, as well as identifies the direction that the Commission has previously provided to staff. And um, there's a lot of illustrations, tables, and other information within these findings. We usually don't have quite these many illustrations, but again, we found it incredibly useful during this process to use illustrations to convey concepts that were really hard to do in a textual manner. Um, and again, I want to remind the Commission that the Planning Commission findings are the Planning Commission's findings. If there's something in there that the Commission says, you know, I don't know if that was the flavor of what we were trying to achieve, you just have to let me know and we will make changes to that. Finally, um, we want to ask permission to make some uh, typographical and grammatical errors we, errors we found within the regulations after it was sent out, of course, last Thursday. And that does happen sometimes. You kind of actually take some time, you read through it, and you say, oh, well, there's one, there's one there. We would ask the Commission to allow us to make those changes to the, the um, uh, draft findings. So why would we want to do this? Well, this is basically some aerial photos of developments that have occurred within the past, you know, 10-ish years. And ranging from anywhere, some 50 lots, where you can see where the existing tree line was, the existing trees, and the result, which is basically very few trees. And this is where the 10% is applied. These are, this is a small project, again, 13 lots. Again, you can see where the majority of the site is occupied by houses, structures, or lots. This is kind of a medium size uh, d development, which again had some existing trees which were removed. This is a little bit larger project. Again, you can see where the existing trees were and how it's been replaced with existing houses. This is a large project where again, we had the same situation. Uh, this is in the southern portion of this community. Basically what's happening underneath our current regulations is that the Single-family residential provisions say that you have to have a certain minimum lot area and a certain minimum lot circle, which is basically a width and dimension standard, within the project and depend upon the zone. For example, this is an R9600. In this case, the, every lot has to be at least 9,600 square feet and accommodate an 80-foot circle. That's basically what these circles here are, are doing. And essentially what this is, this is the test site one that we've been kind of using throughout this that kind of shows how these things occur. The orange circles are existing trees that would be preserved underneath our 10% standard today. As you can see, the blue represents the net buildable area. That's true within all of our single family residential designations, whether it's 9600, 7200, or our 5400D, and that's the smallest detached single family residential provision. Again, the same number of existing trees, the 10% of the site diameter is preserved here. This includes the R40,000, which is our largest single family residential zone. Again, the site is filled up with lots and lot circles, a small access track, but again, the same approximately five trees are preserved. I also wanted to throw in the small site example, because this is about an acre and a tenth. And if they, we have a lot of these because as we showed in that one diagram, we do have a lot of small one to two acre size parcels within the community. And again, usually those are assembled with another development, but they could be individual provisions. And of course, this is a standard for a lot, 9600 plat. Now this one, all the tree retention underneath the current provision, which is 10%, can be satisfied with saving one large cedar tree. And that's one of the provisions about the existing regulations as well as the proposed regulations that would be changed that remains the same is that you could in theory meet all your requ requirements with just one or two trees. 
Um, even a site that doesn't have critical areas or any of those kind of items, again, would have the uh, same provision applies. You apply this lot area, you apply the lot dimensions, and that's what it basically is constructed. So how do we address that? And there is a land use practice called clustering, which allows greater amounts of trees and open space to be preserved and a way for the city to encourage clustering is to provide incentives in the form of bonus lots. And that's one of the other features of the plan unit development provisions that is being reviewed tonight. Uh, this, in, in fact, this illustration shows a, where the uh, development would pre 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 sorry, preserve 20% of the net area as open space and get a 15% increase in lot yield. That's the incentive. And in this case, it ends up being two additional lots. Same thing with the R40,000. However, this is, I wanted to show this illustration because it shows the rounding up provision. You know, they basically the four to nine. And essentially what we would do is it because the math works out to be 4.5 something lots within this development, or again, applying the rounding up, they could add that fifth lot if they provided clustering and provided these open space areas. And I guess I would just note the fact that the ability to preserve large areas of open space is really, really um, interesting as we've gone through these scenarios to look at what could occur here within the city that has not been occurring in the last 10 years. This is the small site. Again, the same thing, it's added one lot because again, we got allowed to allow the rounded up and instead of just the one single cedar tree, there's quite a few additional lots that again can be preserved. This is the site that has no critical areas or any of those features or any existing trees. Again, very simple to provide an open space tract. Now, one of the things the commission was kind of curious about was, what are some of the other adjacent jurisdictions do for as far as regulations? And that was something that we just had not had a lot of time to work on. So essentially what the staff did is that we reviewed the municipal codes of Kirkland, Redmond, and Bellevue and applied their tree retention regulations to the test sites one and three. And the reason we picked Kirkland, Redmond, and Bellevue is because we've heard a lot of people saying that those have reputation for being a better tree retention requirement within that, that, that area. So that's why we picked those. Kirkland is an interesting example because they have a really different mechanism and it's called a tree credit system where the diameter of a tree, for example, a 24 inch, uh, tree is a site eight tree, uh, tree credits is essentially identified and then they give those tree credits to each of those trees based upon the size of it. And they require 30 tree credits per acre in their regulation. Now only trees within public rights of ways and access easements are not allowed to be credited toward retention. What that means is that a tree within a critical area or a critical area buffer could be counted as a retained, a retained tree. Further, Kirkland allows new trees to be substituted for existing trees. And the new trees only have to be four feet high and they are credited as one tree credit per, tr uh, per new tree installed. Rudman had uh, probably the more um, uh, uh, preservation oriented regulation because they preserve 35% of the trees on the subject property. And again, they just measure it by number of trees, not site diameter inches. Um, but they also allow trees within critical areas and critical area buffers to be credited toward 35% provision. Interestingly enough, Redmond allows some administrative modifications to certain standards, setbacks, building height, as a one mechanism to preserve trees. Basically the concept that they do is that they say, look, if you need to have a variation to the setback to save that tree, they will grant that type of thing as an administrative process, a very interesting provision. Bellevue requires all trees within the perimeter landscape area to be preserved, plus requires 50% of the existing, of the significant trees on the site to be retained. Uh, but Bellevue also permits trees within critical areas and buffers to be credited toward that tree retention provision. Um, and at the conclusion of this an analysis, you know, you would expect that, that under different scenarios, Bothell's third draft, and I was basically comparing this against the third draft that's before you tonight, uh, the potential code amendments provide either more equivalent or fewer trees to be retained than those cities. It just depends on your scenario and the situation and how it's applied. Um, and particularly important was the presence of critical areas or buffers or not 
when the or, or um, when clustering is employed or, employed or not. Again, our clustering provision would be a real significant step toward preserving additional trees. And I think it's kind of fair to say that overall, the changes proposed within the third draft bring the city of Bothell's tree re retention requirements kind of more into alignment with those other jurisdictions. I think that uh, what you're gonna see is that you can kind of hold your head up a little higher as you talk to other people, well, yeah, we don't do that, but we have this. So uh, it's a pretty good uh, draft that you have before you. So again, recommended actions for tonight is of course take public testimony, and then after closing public testimony and getting any answers um, to questions you have, uh, close the public hearing, conduct your deliberations, provide any final direction on any changes to the draft planning commission findings you have, as well as any changes to the draft planning commission recommended code amendments, which is the third draft, and finally, the, our recommendation would be the motion to be moved to authorize the chair to sign the planning commission findings as amended if we do amend any amendments and forward a planning commission recommendation of code amendments again as amended tonight uh, to the city council as for their action. So that concludes my presentation. Um, please let me know if you have any specific questions. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Oh, Bruce. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. Um, Real briefly, off the top of my head, like so, so Kirkland, so Kirkland, Bellevue, and Redmond. It specifically said that the critical area tree. I mean, did it specifically say that that you could count trees towards the credits in the critical area, or did it just not specify that you couldn't? Exactly, that's it. Yeah, basically, what they did is they were silent, silent on their that issue. They didn't say, for example, in our third draft, we're, we're recommending that we be very specific that it only be net buildable area that you can use to, for your tree retention uh, number. They do not do that. And if it's silent, that means that you can count any tree upon the site. Okay. Now, and, and I can clarify that. It doesn't mean you can cut them down. It just means you can count them toward your tree retention provision. Got it. Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, and thanks for that great presentation and the great packet as always. Um, this was a particularly daunting one, so thank you for putting it all together and giving us that good review of the meetings we've had before and what we have to review tonight. So um, I guess this would be a good time f uh, to, pay, to take some public testimony for anybody in the audience who, who's joined us tonight. Um, if you wanna come forward and uh, state your name and address, even if you have in the past, please state it again and please hold your comments to uh, three minutes. So would anybody, else, would anybody like to uh, speak tonight from the public? Okay, thank you, sir. I'm uh, Steve Nielsen. My address is 16025 124th Avenue Northeast. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about the rounding up provisions uh, in the code. Uh, and I'll read, read these comments so I don't get uh, get off track here. Um, I'm referring to page 27 of the code amendment. Um, item number 21, rounding up. The practice of rounding up the calculated number of residential lots on a parcel of land is utilized when the parcel size would allow something more than a whole number of lots. Code amendment documents state that to encourage small development participation, the commission finds that a rounding up provision should be employed as a small scale incentive. I truly agree. Uh, in table one, the table one evaluates the impact of three different levels of lot point, five, six, and seven, for each single family residential zoning classification as they would be applied in parcels ranging from one acre to four acres in one quarter acre inc increments. The bonus lot calculations resulted in two specific examples highlighted. One was a 9,600 parcel and then one was an R40,000 parcel. And there was a comment that while a change from four to five lots in the 9,600 parcel was only a 25% change, is, a significant, is not a significant difference. A change from one to two lots, which was the calculation for the R40,000 zone, could be viewed as a one, uh, a 100% change, a significant change. According, and then it says, accordingly, because of that, the Planning Commission finds that rounding up should be employed only at the threshold of four lots or more. 
I suggest to you that, that the evaluation of the Roundup procedure should not be the increase in the number of percentage increase in the number of lots, but should be the size of the parcels, if you will, the average size of the parcels in the subdivision that are created by the rounding up. The, the, the percentage increase has nothing to do with it. If I, if I had a, uh, a, uh, a 79,000 square foot R40,000 zone property, I'd only have one lot. I couldn't round it up. I couldn't divide it into two because I was a thousand square feet short. Uh, doesn't make sense to me. If I had a 16,000 square foot lot in the 8,400 8, zone, all my neighbors live in 8,400 square foot lots. I can't have two lots. I uh, prepared a, um, my uh, matrix, very similar to what's on page, on that page, for parcels less than one acre in size. I'd like you all to have it if you could just spend any time um, reviewing it. Let me just pass it up. And basically what it, with your permission, I'm gonna identify that as exhi exhibit number 11. Uh, okay, great, thanks Bruce. Um, the, the point I want to make is that as you look at it, and my rounding up, um, um, uh, rounding up points are a little more uh, restrictive than, than the ones that are in the code, actually because I stole them from the uh, seat of Kenmore uh, uh, Municipal Code. And I evaluated in 10th in tenth acre increments the size of parcels less than one acre in size. And there are a lot of those mixed in with zoned neighborhoods. And you can see uh, the, through the calculations that there's not that significant, that a significant uh, diversion from the minimum standards of the code. Yet what it does is on a very small incremental basis, it provides more housing in areas where there's already public facilities, public utilities, infrastructure, it's simple, it's straightforward, and it meets the uh, design standards of the neighborhood. I don't think it should be limited, uh, rounding up should be limited to five or more lots. I think there's a lot of inequity in that. It should be start at two, but apply a higher rounding up point. If it's two lots, it's 0.85. If it's three lots, it's 0.7 or some, you know, some number, but not nothing. I think there needs to be some equity uh, in the provision. And, and it implements your comprehensive plan to do, to somehow uh, include this matrix that I prepared in, your in the calculations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nielsen. Do any of the commissioners have any questions for Mr. Nielsen? I think we're all just reviewing the exhibit that you gave us here, so. Does community development have any, do you guys have any comment on what Mr. Nielsen just said with regard, how it varies at all from maybe what you all have proposed? Well, the concept would be that um, the commission could go with a lower number than four if it feels that's important to incentivize clustering within those kind of developments. Um, it was kind of one of those items where um, at the second, no, I think it was, the, I'm sorry, I can't forget which hearing it was, we were kind of okay, well, it, is there a point at which the commission would feel more comfortable and four seemed a logical thing because that's when you transition from a four lot short plot into a five lot subdivision. But the commission can identify a, a different number if they so desire or direct us to in, investigate us. Okay, but we, yeah, if I recall, we had several meetings with regards to this particular topic, right? And yes, we, we decided on the number four. That okay. was what I have in my notes. Okay, but I think that's correct. You know, it's the commission's decision. Is there anybody else in the uh, audience who'd like to speak? Please state your name, address, and uh, please hold your comments to three minutes. Thank you. I'm Bob Hurst, 8516 Northeast Bothell Way. Um, I'd like to support Mr. Nielsen's thoughts. I didn't come here for that, but in listening to him, it makes a lot of sense. Um, 
One of the things we could look at is he's looking at specifically one site, one lot that's 80,000 square feet, wants to divide it into two. What needs to be looked at is a broader area, and if all the other places around there are large lots, um, so one's a tiny bit smaller than all the others. There's still plenty of room around for everybody to share. Um, if it turns out that uh, it goes the other way, and there's a bunch of small lots, and you know, it, it, it's all crammed up, maybe not. But what we need to do is rather than looking at just the one specific lot, we look at the surrounding area and see if some of those lot, if the whole thing meshes and works. So I think a broader look than re just at the one piece of property is in order. You look at the surrounding pieces and see if, you know, maybe squeezing a little would mesh because there's plenty of room on the adjacent property. Some of them are a little over, a little under, whatever. But, you know, it doesn't have to be an exact hard number for, for the square footage. Why I am here, though, is I'd like to support clustering. Uh, my reason, and the tree, the tree retention thing's good, uh, I have kids that can't afford to live in this town anymore, and I believe that bringing these numbers down, the density numbers up, uh, to put in smaller lots with smaller homes redirects the way property is going right now. We have, we have 7,200 square foot lots and smaller that have 4,000 4, square foot homes on them that are going for almost a million dollars. That's crazy in this town. That's a trend that has to be changed. Um, unless you're a dot-com couple making big money, you can't afford that. The blue-collar people that have actually made Bothell over the years are being squeezed out. They're living in Arlington, Marysville, and places like that for affordability. Ms. Eggard here is, is very good about keeping us healthy and green with nature, but I contend that all the people that have to work in Seattle, Bellevue, that commute between, between these northern points and down create more greenhouse gas and carbon emissions than if they just lived here in a small house. I'd like to see, I have a property that's subject to this, and I'd like to see small lots. I'd like to see 1,600 square foot, two-story homes on them, and clustered together with a big open area in front for kids to play, trees and things like that. That's the way I think we should go. Uh, these mega mansions on tiny lots with huge footprints, yeah, they gotta go. We can't have that stuff anymore, it's nuts. So I'd like to see more density, more affordability for people in the, in, in that can't afford it right now. We bring down lot prices, house prices go down, they get affordable. And we need to do it fairly soon. The interest rate climate is very, very favorable right now for home ownership. 3% mortgages and stuff, it makes things very affordable. And it's a good time to do it right now as soon as possible. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurst. Is there anybody else in the uh, audience would like to speak? Good evening, my name is Shauna Madden. My address is 9229 Northeast 173rd. I've been to several of these meetings and I appreciate the commitment that everybody has here. I didn't expect to speak tonight, but I, I was moved by the people who spoke before me. It seems to me like if we're talking about a particular property or a particular request, that we already have a way of, of discussing that with Bothell outside the process. It seems like what we're discussing here is what that process is, sort of in the 80-20 rule. What we're talking about here is making changes so 80% of the time we can make a fairly simple, quick, inexpensive decision that's going to be in the best interest not only of the people who want to do the development but of the city in general. The other 20% Obviously, we'll have to go through the other petition processes and work more closely with the county in those areas. I also wanted to comment on the last gentleman's uh, point. Uh, I don't see small houses being built. I see small lots. I don't see small houses. I am all for affordability. What I am not for is growth that will eliminate the bothel that we have all come to love. I understand there's money to be made, there's a market, there's a lot of wonderful development of infrastructure being done here. And I want this to be a place where I and my family and his children want to live in the future. And that's what we're looking for. I think one of the reasons we came up with the four lots, for example, was the thought in our in our last full meeting that on a smaller site 
the amount of property we'd be able to set aside as open space would not necessarily be viable in and of itself. Does that make sense? I think we need to carefully consider the changes that we're making. I believe these are definitely moving us in the right direction. However, I'm one of those people who across the street, somebody knocked down this lovely little farmhouse that had all these crazy wild bunnies and put down six homes, two stories high, five feet apart, maybe six feet. I don't think it's that far. but five-ish feet apart from one another and sold them all for $750,000 each before they were finished. Great, somebody made a fortune. I'm not envious of that. What I miss is the little farmhouse and the bunnies, but I know we have to grow, right? We have to be able to get on with it. So as we look at these changes, I want us to maintain that balance, that maturity, where we can say, you've got a property that's pretty close to being what we would consider easily subdividable. So let's take a look at this. I'd also like us to keep in mind that whatever we do is likely going to have the largest, most expensive dream kitchen kind of property on it, which is still not gonna be affordable. I gotta tell you, I probably couldn't afford to buy a house. I probably couldn't aff afford to buy a house here now. So I definitely understand that. I'm watching what's happening in Black Diamond. I'm watching what's happening in Marysville, in Arlington. We are not the only community struggling with maintaining our identity and our quality of life and also taking advantage of growth and letting people join our community. But please keep in mind that that's a balance. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Do any commissioners have any questions for the speaker? Thank you very much for those comments. Is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak this evening? For you, is this right side up or upside down? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm Ann Agard at 16524 104th Avenue Northeast. I request that you not close the public hearing or adopt findings and conclusions as presented in this May 3rd packet. Questions that need to be have not been answered, which include, among others, how much, if any, of the 89 acres of the Wayne Golf Course possible purchase by the city is included in the R9600 total 360.53 acres of vacant or underutilized land? I referred to the acreage tables on page 28. Bruce has answered the question that I had posed earlier about where the 60% minimum lot area and 60% minimum lot circle in the R40,000 came from. But this is simply not applicable to this area. That was for Fitzgerald, where you have a 60% forest cover. You don't even have anything you're talking about here with a 60% forest cover, and you don't have anything where you're talking about 23% impervious surface area, and this is not an LID. 
as the special regulations in Fitzgerald. So please remove the 60% uh, land area and 60% minimum lot circle in the R40,000. In the facts and findings on page 28, there's this table that is titled uh, Total Net Acres Available for Development, and it's based on underutilized and vacant lands and number of projected lots by each single family residential zoning classification. Um, please clarify what is meant by underutilized. Is vacant the vacant lot, and is it all within that? in that zoning criteria, and what is really assumed as buildable. We think we know what these things mean, but it really doesn't, we really don't know, particularly what underutilized means. <clears throat> so I uh, reviewed the current packet. I sent you an, um, another email on April 26th after reading Andy Locke's memo talking about a 55% uh, UTC goal for the city. And I trust that this, this memo is your exhibit 10 in your packet, but I did ask that Bruce send that memo. And basically what I have specifically requested in that memo is that for the Wayneda, Simons Road, Norway Hill, sub area plan area, that you use a urban tree canopy 39% or higher as the applicable coverage for 9,600, and that you use a 58% or higher your urban tree canopy coverage uh, for the, the R40,000. There should be no net loss in urban tree canopy for any of this area. Why should this be? Because this area has, needs to maintain its urban tree kind of, it is the groundwater aquifer for streams that provide cool waters to the Sammamish River. It also, as you see on this map, there is only one area in all of Bothell that is zoned as R40,000 outside of the Fitzgerald area, and that is on Norway Hill. And surrounding that area, and you can't see it too clearly, but I have marked this as 9,600. Surrounding the, the lower slopes of Norway Hill, it's all 9,600. Don't know how much of that 9,600 is included in the total acreages on the chart, but it is significant, and some of that is in the Wayne Golf Course area. So I did reference in my memo to you the uh, pages from the uh, document, uh, the urban tree canopy cover for Bothell, point out that there are 1,478 acres in this sub-area plan, 804 acres of urban tree canopy, which amounts to 54%. This area is highly subject to erosion and landslides. These slides are taken from January when the hill of the area on 15949 on 105th, you can see the plastic covering the landslide. And following that, there was a second landslide below that. And now there is a stream coming out of that area. How are we doing on time? Uh, we're over five minutes now, so if you could wrap up your okay, comments. Okay, I will wrap up and I'll just submit a few more of the pictures. Here is another picture of the stream that is now coming out of Norway Hill, a new one. We assume that the, and you can see how this whole landslide area is, it's not, it's not vegetated, so it's coming through the slide. Here is another one of that same slide. You can see the water. And two other ones I will show you. This is in the 9600 area. This is the slant slide just on 112th as you go up the hill. And to show you that, so this was cleared off, obviously. But now it's really wonderful because the tree city put a bunch of hay up there. And you can see the water and the mud continuously work down the hillside. Now this is 9,600, not the 40,000. 
and you see clearly that there's groundwater that's coming out of Norway Hill. So I ask that you not approve and close the public hearing and that you put a tree, urban tree canopy limitation on this planning area. Thank you. Any Thank you. questions? Any questions for the speaker tonight? And I, I appreciate uh, the comments. Um, we've been pretty much notified that we do need to bring a council wants this to come before them. We need to get some action on on this and wh whatever we come to tonight certainly will not be a perfect solution. Um, but council is, is waiting for this so that we can get a clustering ordinance in and so we can start protecting some of the open spaces that are out there, so. I, I understand that, but I think I, I am talking in this case, I am talking particularly about the tree retention regarding the Wayneda, Simons Road, Norway Hill area. And if you feel that you have to close it tonight to move forward, then you can certainly close it with a recommendation that they use an, the urban tree canopy. All, all of the figures are there that you need in the urban tree canopy. It's right here. Uh, did that go off, Drew? I did. Uh, I have the, all the figures. Yeah, we uh, to, And they're in, you've got them. Okay. The only thing I would say, so that's the tree retention part. Regarding the clustering, I would say that for Norway, only Norway Hill, the 40,000, I see absolutely no justification to include clustering for the R40,000. There are all of five vacant one acre parcels and it's just not going to happen. But certainly with the 9,600. Okay. So if you have to close it, please close it with those recommendations. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for your time. And thank you for that good presentation. Oh, did you have something, Commissioner Zorns? Okay. So I hope I'm not shanghaiing in uh, this conversation, but I, I, I am very curious that, uh, that uh, Ms. Agard came with the, um, the question uh, raised to us to con include the UTC for this specific area because as I was going through this, I was thinking I like the percentages, I like the percentages, but when I was going through this independently and thinking about erosive soils and tree canopies and what they do to affect that whole watershed area, UTC makes a huge sense to me here. So I guess my question is to throw out to the Planning Commission if Bruce doesn't kill us, <laughs> could we have one specific area, you know, if you cut, cut the swath, Norway Hill, Wainita, um, Simons Road area, where, where there are erosive soils and the steep slopes, um, could we, would you entertain having a UTC applied to this portion of Bothell separately and then the rest of Bothell has the tree retention percentages. Just, I, I'm just pus putting it out there to see what your thoughts are. I just have a quick question. Are, are you, you're talking to the commissioners? Yes. So we should probably let Ms. Agard sit down then if she's. Would you like to sit down? She's done. I'll do whatever. I thought you might have some well, Somebody else might have questions, but I, I would like to know if the planning commission so. would be willing to discuss or entertain that idea of having this area where there's really erosive soils having a UTC applied to it. Yeah, I think we are just discussing amongst okay. ourselves now okay. and we'll, we'll, con we'll let you know if we need to speak to you further. Thank you, Ms. Agard. Does anybody have any uh, comments with regards to Commissioner Zorn's question? I mean, I guess that's something we can do as we go through the packet later and possibly even we can make a recommendation or and or just need not a recommendation, but even if we don't, I mean, because we're not gonna have time to get through everything we want to get through tonight that we already have on our plate, um, that we could have the council possibly look into that particular sub area, but uh, without recommendations, just because we didn't have time to get to it. But. I, I have oh, yeah? a thought on that. Bruce, how many, how many 
How long has this public hearing process been going on for the clustering and the tree retention? Well, the first hearing was January the 18th or 19th, something like that. And we've come a long way. I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to start adding. If we're expected to make a decision tonight, I'm hesitant to start making too many changes. My understanding at the, after the last meeting was there were some fairly minor tweaks to make. I think we still needed to kind of decide on what that particular appropriate minimum percentage of tree retention was and that kind of thing. And I think we've done that. I feel like we're to the point now where I think we should, if we look at those specific items that were in question at, after the, the last uh, hearing or the last um, planning commission meeting, my thought is we should stick to those things and, uh, and leave it at that for now. Okay. It just you, seems a little late. Okay. Any other comments, uh, Commissioner Cecil? Um, yeah, so I mean, it, I guess, you know, the report that we're looking at here for the for the canopies and the UTCs, even the recommendations in the report basically says what we should do now after seeing the results of this report is to develop an urban forest management plan. And so I think kind of just shooting stuff out, making like last minute changes, I don't know if that's the approach to, to use on this. So that's that's my comments. Okay, a more comprehensive. So I guess I'd be supportive of moving ahead with kind of what we've already been discussing the last several months. Okay, thanks. Commissioner Cape. Um, I don't want to derail the momentum, but I do want to get it right. So I think, I mean, as I read through it, I have more than a few, I guess, minor changes. Just some themes in here that I thought were different than what we discussed that I would like to go back and revisit. Um, this is a little bit different than that, but um, if there was momentum across the board to you know, incorporate or make a, a bigger change, I'm okay, I'm okay with talking about it and looking at it just because I agree we put a lot of time into it, but um, I want to give them, the, the council, as much information as possible and have it well thought out, so. Any other commissioners? Any comments on that? Okay. So I guess, I guess with that, uh, we can go ahead and we have sought a lot of testimony over um, the last several months, back going back to January. Uh, we've been through the packet a few times. We've had three me previous meetings on this and a study session. Four, okay. So I guess at this time, I would like to, um, you know, Bruce, do we go ahead and close the, do we go ahead and close the public hearing on it or do we just go ahead and we'll do that at the end with regards to public comment? My recommendation, do it at the end. Okay. So with that, I guess uh, what I would recommend, if unless anybody else has any other thoughts on it, is to is to kind of go page by page through um, through the packet, unless maybe we can go around and uh, I guess before or maybe before that, what we could do is if commissioners have any. Um, uh, let me just get a, a let me just look around to see. These are the two options as I see it. We go through the packet page by page. People comment, and we can we, we can vote on anything that we need to vote on. One being, as um, Commissioner Clark said, one of the bigger items is that percentage we need to get to with regards to minimum for tree retention, and any other things that might come up. Unless other commissioners have something they would want to start off with before we start going through the packet. I, I actually wanted to ask staff a clarifying question. Yeah, let's about do that. Oh yeah, yeah. This, this is a good time to start that. Let's do that. Um, this is uh, was a item at the last meeting that we talked about uh, these smaller projects and I think at one point we were talking about not allowing any any sort of incentive to do the the um, uh, tree retention on the smaller parcels or excuse me smaller parcels that might be you know short plats or just over short plats up to 10 lots um, I'm not I don't totally understand the logic behind the the what and it's partly what um, Mr. Nielsen was talking about it as well. Um, it's a little bit confusing to me as to why there's a limit on the roundup, like, and 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 also there's a why there's a limit on the density bonus for lots projects that are say five to ten lots because or five to nine lots because you, you could I mean if you were to get the I'm, I don't have it right off the top of my head but the maximum bonus you can get is twenty five percent is that or twenty percent what are we overall I mean on is it 30? Is it? I'm going to have to look at that. I'm sorry. 
Well, what it, whatever it is, when it, that that would be a significant. I mean, on a five lot plat, a twenty percent bonus would add a lot. So, I'm not sure why we're taking that incentive away from those size of plats um, for 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 those size because we are talking about from four to nine only allowing the roundup provision. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Because it seems to me like we should give the choice to the uh, property owner as to whether they would like to use utilize the roundup or the the density bonus. Because I think there are situations on a say a nine lot uh, plat seems like a twenty five percent would add would would add an additional two lots. Am I just doing the math in my head? But then we're not allowing that to happen. Is that correct? Um, for less than nine, that would be correct, yes. I just don't remember what our line of reasoning was for that because it seems to be a significant um, opportunity for vegetation retention, for tree retention. And, and so why, why are we not willing to allow that incentive to encourage that to happen on those, I guess, is my question. I don't, I don't really understand that. And then, and then the roundup part of that, why it wouldn't apply to say a, a three lot plat or something like that. That's those are the only things that I'm trying to clarify. Are we maybe doing that with regards to? Because um, I remember that we were, for instance, with regards to is it is it tree retention? There were certain things if you did, if you had like less than two thousand square feet of required, you know, uh, was it required? Right, yeah, Typically, if you're less than 2,000, you don't have to provide for the landscaping providers. You don't have to regulate. provide for, yeah. And I mean, is it kind of the same time? A tree retention plan, per se. Um, but I think what Commissioner Clark is saying, he's saying maybe there's some space between four and nine to allow something more than just the rounding up. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah, I, I, okay. I'm just asking the question, and I'm frankly at this point I'm fine either way. I just want to make sure we don't that we're all on the same page. We all understand what what's what's happening on those projects of that size because you brought in some really valuable inf information. I think it was at the last meeting where you brought in and said, "Hey, how many acres of of those smaller parcels, or how many of those parcels are there?" And we know that there's a significant significant number of them, and if they're not if we don't offer an incentive, then we stand. We run the risk of losing the vegetation or the tree retention that we could gain on, on those by, by allowing that flexibility. So I think what I'm hearing is that on page 18 of the uh, draft regulations, line number nine, where it identifies there'd be subdivisions of 10 or more lots, I think what I'm hearing is that it would be less than 10 that you'd be allowed to do the increases. That, that's, I guess that's the question I'm asking because okay. I, I just want to make sure we're not missing an opportunity for a significant tree retention on those smaller subdivisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because one of the examples was a small subdivision of five lots does have the potential to preserve a pretty good hunk of land for open yeah. space. Well, you know that a five lot subdivision in an R9600 zone is at least an acre, right? So it's at least 43,000 square feet. Right. And if you're able to save 20, 25, 30% of the trees on that, that's pretty significant. That's well potentially doubling what we're talking about for the mandatory tree retention. Yes. Can I ask a clarifying question, Commissioner Clark? So um, the the bonus that we're talking about, the, the density bonus that we're talking about, Bruce, that applies to clustering, correct? It I does, mean, yes. tree retention is a separate, I mean, it, it's part of the process, but in terms of this calculation for bonus density, that is simply for putting open space aside. That's, well, that's different than retaining a specific amount of tree diameter inches. That's it, correct? It, that, it, yes, it is. Yes, okay, it I just is, wanted yes. to, I, I'm I wasn't using the sure you tree going, retention so. loosely, not, not okay. on, as a percentage, okay. but as a, right. you're right, it is open space, that's correct. And then, I guess in my mind, I'm seeing the rounding issue. I always thought that was a, a methodology to how we calculate things, but the density bonus was an actual calculation. So those two, those the rounding and the density bonus could apply to the same calculation. I mean, they 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 all do, right? If it's if you get if you're setting aside open space, and you get whatever it is, 10% bonus density, 
that goes into your calculation of how many units you get. And when you get a number, 8.65, you round that number. That's just. It, ah. I think the rounding is 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 a replacement for the the density bonus on the smaller project. The it way is, the code's yes. written it now, is, yes. it, okay. it's not a it's not, not a yes. It's not both. And so I, it's so it's a different kind of bonus. Yes. Yeah. That was the idea. Was we were talking about at one time not allowing any, not having any incentive for those smaller projects, and then the idea came up. Well. Maybe we don't offer the incentive, but we offer the rounding. And my thought is that maybe we ought to offer the rounding. We ought to offer, allow the, the choice maybe to, a, to a, um, a property owner of those smaller projects. Because in some cases, they may round up and get one additional lot if they have a nine, you know, nine units and they're, they might be, not be able to utilize the density bonus and get, and get two more lots. And that might be the thing that tips the scale for them to, put, to set aside the additional open space. I may be a little bit simple, but I would prefer that we figure out where to apply the bonus, the density bonus, how small we go on that, and just keep the rounding consistent. And I, I, I would suggest we keep the rounding available for all these calculations. I don't know if that's going to work, but that, that's how I see it almost everywhere else. Where I agree. In, yeah. um, in, in cities and counties around here. So that would be my recommendation. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? Does anybody have any thoughts with regards to what Christian McCulloch was just speaking of? Mr. Cape. Um, I've got a, a few thoughts. So with the rounding in general, I think after our first meeting, I talked to a developer after the meeting, and they mentioned that incentivizing some of these smaller developments, we would look at maybe a reduction of sidewalk, of lane widths for the drive aisles, and some of that hard surface area. Now we've taken it to um, a rounding of lots. It seems like we've progress more aggressive. Now there was never language thrown around the reduction of hard surface areas, so it's not like we went down the road with that, but I'm just saying we've kind of gone from a departure. When I look at clustering, I'm thinking that the main objective is preserving open space. Um, it's not an incentivized to increase density. We've met our requirements in King and Snohomish County. We do need to incentivize people to do it. Um, we can't just hope that they set aside part of their property and give up profits. but. I guess I'm I'm concerned on the smaller scale. I think, Mr. Nielsen, you brought up like an R40,000 square foot lot. It seems like we would have so many tables kind of looking at every scenario, but I'm less concerned about some of the bigger ones. I mean, if you were going from one to two and setting aside a large set part of your property for open space, that seems to make sense. I'm more concerned on the smaller side. So if we're looking at a four unit development at 5,400 square feet, that's 24,000 square feet of developable area, let's say. Roughly, that's 2,400 square feet of open space that we're creating and giving up an additional lot for it as a city. Um, you know, that comes with taxes and that comes with housing and all sorts of other benefits. But where is, what's the definition of open space? I mean, in my mind, not a 20 by 100 strip. I mean, I think we're trying to preserve M more and greater. Anything we can get is a positive, it's a benefit to the city, and we have a lot more uh, smaller lots than we have big open pieces of land, so I know we have to do something on the smaller ones. I'm just, I guess I was not really comfortable when the uh, roundup was, rounding up was brought into the conversation a couple meetings ago, and, um, and it's mainly for that reason on the very small lots, we're not really gaining much open space, and that, that should be the purpose, I think, at least, of what we're talking about here. Any other comments? Oh, uh, Commissioner Wickwire. Yeah, I guess I'm not in favor of applying the double incentive across, you know, where if you did a large area to get the bonus calculation plus a roundup. Um, so that, to me, is, you know, you're going to optimize then around. I mean, you have to create the incentives. Uh, um, and I'm obviously late, this is my first meeting to talk about this, um, this project. Um, uh, if we went that route, I'd want another meeting to talk about it and see the effect, because there's a lot of calculations and, and thought gone into the process so far, so to kind of change the, the approach at this point, uh, I would say, hey, we need to put the brakes on getting this to council and, and kind of relook at some of these things. Not that they're bad ideas, but, but to just, step back and, and, and rather than kind of a last minute change that, that feels a little more dramatic. I guess 
I would have to um, agree with Commissioner Wickwire there. I think we, I mean, what we talked about in the past, we did, I remember we talked about it for several, for several meetings when we came to a conclusion of what we did. Um, I mean, it is something that the council will have a chance to look into, um, but I, I guess I'm kind of comfortable with what we have. All right. D does anything, uh, does anybody else have any other questions they wanted to ask to, for community development before we kind of got underway going through the packet more granu granularly? Actually, and Bruce, I have a question for you. C can you, um, uh, uh, Citizen Agard out there, she had a question about underutilized. Like, what's the definition of that? When yeah, I essentially, what we identified as underutilized was a piece of property that was one acre in size or greater and had one house on it. Right and that's what we're seeing a lot of small plats that is exactly in that kind of configuration. There's one house on one or two or three acres, and that's what we determined was an underutilized lot. Thank you. And I, I, Bruce, I have a question for you. Something that uh, before we get underway, at least from my standpoint, and then I'll open up for any additional questions before we go through it. On, um, and maybe we are going through the packet, but I guess just up front, I was looking at, uh, you know, I guess I'm pretty visual when it comes to understanding certain topics like this important one we're discussing right now. Um, on, um, when you gave the uh, the pictures of the the plats of, of, of some of the, uh, some of the current uh, development that's gone on in the last few years. I, something that struck me was the lack of trees at 10%, we, at, our, at least at our current code, assuming that all of these, um, all of these subdivisions went in at 10%. Um, I mean, I'm looking at uh, Aaron Estates, Canfield, Crown Woods, and, and uh, is it McC McLean, and I mean, maybe it's th they're under the red line, but I don't see very many trees, like if any. And you're correct, there are not a lot of trees. It's the 10% standard. And generally where those are located, and the red line does kind of cover up some stuff, but Aaron Estates, I'll pull that one up. I've got the one up on the slide. There's a tree here, there's a tree here, there's a tree here, there's a tree over here, and there's a tree over here. And that's so all it took. Are those those are actually on within the property lines? Yes. Are, what do you do? You get a do you get credit for a tree when it's on a kind of shared? Like I have a huge cedar on the back of my lot, and it's on a. It's actually it goes on four lots. <laughs> it's right in the corner. So like, how does that work? Typically, what happens is if you have control, a tree will let you count it as a retention tree. If it's one of those situations where there may be some dispute as to who has it. Usually what the development review staff will say, hey, look, I, I appreciate what you want to do here and you want to save it, but it would be subject to somebody else's uh, objectives and not the development's objectives. So we want to make sure we have those trees that can be saved. So if it's not on your property, and let's say it's partly on your property, a lot of times the development review uh, planner will not allow that tree, most of the time they will not allow that tree to be counted toward the tree retention standard. Okay. And that's one of the things that is so important because when we get a development application, we actually have a pretty tight uh, site survey of the piece of property and they locate those trees pretty accurately. Sometimes there's a little bit of fluff here and there, but they're usually pretty accurately located. And that's part of the evaluation that goes through on these particular projects. Okay, thank you. Was there another one you want to look at? Um, yeah, I just, it's it's astounding to me that this is 10 percent, but it, apparently it is. It's, and to re, I've said this several times where it's 10 percent of significant trees, so it's not 10 percent of the trees. It's just exactly. 10 percent of significant trees. Now here is a good example. Canfield uh, is a, basically the Hopkins Nursery. They have an incredibly large, sorry, redwood tree right here. I mean it's really huge. That kind of size of 45 or 48 inches, something like that can accommodate a lot of 10% tree retention requirement. Diameter inches. 
Commissioner Kane, a question for Bruce. Um, just a general question. I know we're gonna go through the findings later, but attachment A, it doesn't have a page number, but it's um, basically your summary, Bruce. Oh yeah, and the first page, first page usually doesn't have a page number, whatever Microsoft product it is. Um, it's in the middle of the page, it's a bullet point about include passive open space such as trails, small shelters, playgrounds, etc., to be counted toward open space. I remember talking about trails, but I don't really remember any built facilities to be included in the open space. Do you guys have a feeling one way or another on that? Did I record that incorrectly? That the That's why I guess I'm asking. To have? I, I do remember it coming up. I don't know that we included anything, but I remember that question coming up as to, hey, what's, you know, is there value to having trails or, or you know, basketball courts or, you know, What's the definition? And I don't know that we, I don't know that we landed on that, okay. but there was there was some discussion. There was discussion. I don't. I, I do remember that. I don't remember what we came to a decision on. I, I think on whether it was just open space or what it could be used for. I know there was a list of criteria uh, listed in order of importance, and. I think a couple of those were, were down on the list more because basically in, in the clustering mechanism, it seems to me we're looking more for open space preservation. Tree forest areas is the primary concern, yes. Um, yeah, and I now, now I recall that, yeah, there was some discussion about this type of a passive use, little yeah. picnic shelters or gazebos and things like that should be compatible with that type of a uh, activity, but. I think the discussion was around, was, was partly around just trying to make it so that these open space areas weren't just completely shut out to any use at all because I think one of the values of having open space is being able to use it and I think that the word passive was definitely used. I don't think we're talking about, um, you know, building a baseball field or something like that but I think it's more trails and, and, and I think picnic tables and benches fit, things that go along with a trail seem to fit with that. I, I think that was the idea was more passive use but, but that we weren't going to, lock people out of these areas. We're gonna, you know, offer the opportunity to, to actually use it. Commissioner Zorns? I, I, ju I just recall that our concern was that it was always pervious soil that we were talking about. So, so that, you know, if it was something where you were putting pavers and that sort of thing down, we were concerned about that. But if it was pea patches or horseshoes or whatever, that would count, I, count as part of um, our open spaces. That's what I recall from it. Uh, Commissioner Cade? Uh, I'm fine with picnic benches and um, trails, anything like that. I guess if this is counting towards open space and it serves as an amenity for that development, killing two birds with one stone, like it's a thousand square foot play area for kids that's chipped and sort of different, I don't really see how that kind of fits with what we're trying to do. So that's all I'm trying to avoid. And that description is on page 18, line 39 and 40. And again, more than willing to modify that if we so does, if the commission so directs. I'm looking at my notes from the meeting on the uh, January 25th, and I was kind of writing down the key points that you were going to go back and work on. And the first one says, maximize passive use of preserved open space. Um, and the two notes I have there are stormwater and recreation. I'm not sure what the intent, meaning, those are just my jotted notes, but, um, so I think there definitely was an emphasis on passive. Right, I'm pretty certain. And if, it, I, I do remember in the discussion that like, I, we're looking at this, this is number F, I mean this, this letter F here, so it's definitely down on the list with regards to city recommendations with regards to approval of this for a, a development. Yeah, and it is a hierarchical preference list, but uh, we can very easily take out things like gazebos and covered shelters, which is kind of, I'm hearing is what the commission is identifying as a concern. And then the rest of those things are pretty passive items, benches, picnic tables, things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah, I know we're jumping ahead into page 18 and 19, but that was a question I had. F and then at the latter part of G, I, I was completely baffled why uh, um, an underground, you know, 
storm detention pond that's huge gets counted towards open space that then you know gets them into this open space. I mean, open space for me is you're taking out of the net buildable area, and for me, a storm detention pond is part of the it's it's a required part of the buildable area that shouldn't get credit for anywhere else. Uh, and so, if and and I'm um, in agreement with Commissioner McCabe that I'm fine with playgrounds, and rather than having it be uh, a fenced off area that's just, you know, it's like the areas that are around I, uh, 405 where the ducks are and around the, you know, it's this um, kind of miserable little area just to keep it open. Um, but not having structures, gazebos and, you know, picnic benches and, uh, or, or, uh, or, or um, sitting spaces, but trails, but generally to be a preserved open space, uh, not you know, sport courts and, you know, things like that, which if, if a developer wants to put those amenities in a development, they can count that towards, you know, in the in the rest of their billable area, which they're probably not going to do. So, unless it's on the, uh, you know, definitely see the play areas on top of the, uh, on the storm detention ponds, which is pretty, pretty common. Mr. Cecil. Yeah, I think the, the underground facilities that we were talking about at the time, I want to say those were underground vaults mm -hmm. that, you, that you cover over. And that's, I don't know, that's a little different than, that's not supernatural, even though it's underground. So I don't, I get that. Maybe, you know, you could put a playground over it, that's for sure. Um, they, this talks about sports courts. You know, those are impervious. So I don't know, maybe it sounds like we're kind of leaning, Bruce, towards let's try to move away as much as possible from impervious, you know, large impervious surfaces. That's just, I'm just throwing that out as kind of a summary of what I'm hearing, but. Uh, That's what I'm hearing, but. I'm, I, I'm hearing that, I don't know if I got is, four saying that. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Are, are there, is there a commissioner here who'd like to maybe speak uh, to the opposing view there? Well, I, I don't have a question view, but I think we need to look at what, what are we what are we talking about here? If you're talking about an underground storm detention vault, that's a concrete structure that has a concrete lid on it. Um, if it's more less than you know a couple feet underground, you're effectively looking at impervious surface there anyway. So I'm not sure that it would matter if you put a sport cart on top of it. I, I think it's you know what's going to happen is I think the reason for limiting impervious or yeah limiting impervious surface is to give the opportunity for groundwater recharge, which is not gonna happen over a, storm a concrete storm detention vault in any case. So I think that um, it is. it does t seem to be a fairly popular way to take advantage of the space that a vault takes up to build something over it that can be can be utilized by the community, um, whether that's a, an op just a landscaped area or a landscape area with a small playground or a landscape area with a sport court. I've seen them all. I've seen them have tennis courts built on top of them, and it, and it seems to me to be a fairly reasonable use. I don't think that's, uh, and I think that's gonna be fairly limited. It's the, um, you're, you're gonna be talking about a track that was specifically set aside for detention that somebody wants to kind of get a little bit more bang for their buck out of. and I. I in that particular instance, I don't see a big issue with it. I think it's more, if, if we allowed it on top of the storm vault, that would be different than saying, hey, let's allow it everywhere, you know, including, you know, areas that truly are areas that we might have stormwater recharge or that sort of thing. So I think I'm hearing it on item F, the gazebos and covered shelters and playgrounds would not be included in that category of open space. Mm -hmm. But on number G, where you are putting in a forced equivalent service water vault, we'll call it, that on top of those things could be located those type of facilities. Or am I, I'm hearing two different things. Yeah, what I was saying is they can, that can be done anyways, but as far as in this calculation of what is open space for this clustering, those don't count. Anything that's storm retention, that's a, built area as part of just the design, they shouldn't, it shouldn't be a, a, a credit towards this open space calculation. Um, that's gonna be true op open space uh, that's not developed, uh, that doesn't have, uh, I mean, if there's a utility, you know, an ease, easement of utility that's already through there, of course, that's something that's already through there, but in calculating the open space for this incentive and credits, it shouldn't, it shouldn't count towards that. Okay. So it'd be striking. It would it would count, uh, you know, kind of natural um, surface water facilities, bio, you know, those things. But I think you strike G. Um, 
completely in, in the parts of F that you suggested. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. But but let's, yeah, we'll take a vote. We'll either we can do it now or we're going to go through the whole packet, uh, Commissioner Zorns. Just one quick question. I may have missed it. Do we have open space defined? Because if we defined open space, then we can say, does it meet the, do, all these pieces that we're talking about, does it meet the criteria for what an open space is? In my mind, an open space is not just a place where a building is vacant. An open space is part of, can you plant a tree? Can you dig in the dirt? Yes. And so do we have a definition of what open space is? We are pretty specific about the type of land to be preserved as open space. And that's number two. Number it's two. just above that. And then we go A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. The discussion is to take out G. Because yeah, it doesn't fit our definition. I mean, right. if we look at this as say, this is our big definition of open this, space. This is the type of land that could be created as open space. So, but when we hit G, we hit a, a brick wall because now it's because now it's changing the dynamics of what we're setting the stage of what open space looks like. I think I, I, that's all I'm saying is, it, yes. is that if we have a definition, then we can say, does it meet the criteria for what an open space is? I think Commissioner Wickler, and this brings up a good point with respect to G, but I, I, do, I do think this is a hierarchical chart and uh, or order of open spaces, and so if there's a property that a developer wants to to build on and there's no way that they can do A through F, do we want them to just not do anything at all? Or do we want them to try to put in a surface water management storm drain or equivalent to, uh, to try to retain some of that runoff and try to avoid some of those uh, landslides that, that Ms. Agard was showing us images of? And uh, I, I'm, I'm curious what the, uh, the alternative to not having this in here would be, what would the developer do? Commissioner Cecil? Um, I'm looking at G and I think, I don't know that we should strike the whole G. I think um, forest equivalent surface water facilities are not vaults. I'm sorry, yeah. Those are more um, dispersion trenches, that kind of thing, maybe biofiltration swales. So, but I, 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 so I think what you're saying is that more the vault, the structural stuff, or the or open water ponds. I don't know. We're talking I, about ponds too, or just I, vaults. I feel like letter E are, touches on what you just said. I mean, that's what to water facilities, bio infiltration, or oh, right. Okay. So we've already yeah, got that. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. It, yeah, the the first sense of G meant to keep. It's the rest of it. Uh, but we already say that in E. Yes, yeah, so we could so, strike all of you, yeah, exactly. So Thank because you for the clarification. Because as part of just being part of Bothell, they have to have a, a stormwater detention plan. I mean, there's a new development up on 88th near our house, and it took them three months or two months to build this massive underground for the 12 homes being developed there. It's, every project has that. So one other question. Um, Bruce, I believe there's also a requirement in a, say, like a subdivision for, for recreational either open space or some kind of mitigation for, for recreation? That's only on a large piece of property, five acres or greater. Okay, so over five, okay. And that's a, it's I guess, a real small amount. I guess my point is, I, I don't think the intent of this section is to, um, in other words, if, the, if there's a, a 10 acre plat and they're doing an open space tract and they're getting credit for recreation and preserved open space, I think we want to try to avoid that. I don't know if that would come up, but, you know, we're talking about, you know, playgrounds meeting open space requirements. Does that also meet recreational requirements? In other words, can they, can they just smack all that stuff right on top of each other and get double credit for it? Well, you could certainly, if you provide a playground or another structure over the top of the vault, you can count that as your recreational standard. And your open space? Well, that's what I'm asking. That's the idea behind G would be currently yes, if you kept okay. it in place. If you remove it, no. That would be the response. If, if we have the opportunity to have a property owner build a playground on top of a vault, why wouldn't, why wouldn't we want them to do that? I'm not saying you wouldn't. I'm saying that meets recreational open space requirements. I, I, I guess it... it you, because you may not, I mean, you, you, your options are you might have a vault with 
a just a backfill and 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 grass on it, I guess, or you might, or, or you ha or you could by doing this have a vault that might have a slide and a swing set and a playground and, and that sort of thing on it. Is is there a um, is there a preference not to have the the recreation aspect of it for I mean play areas for kids and that kind of thing? I'm, I'm I don't quite understand that. I guess, and I'm just kind of summarizing my sense of of our consensus. What I'm hearing is that. Um, we're kind of moving more towards passive mm -hmm. recreation as opposed to active recreation. Okay. So that that seemed to be kind of a kind okay. of a threshold. I I, I don't want to speak for everybody, yeah. but that seems like that's the way. It and I and I'm in favor of the passive thing overall. So I guess that being said, um, that being said, then if it were a passive use that were on on in that area, that would be acceptable. Is that what we're saying? Like if it was a trail and a Picnic table or something? Yeah, and it wouldn't it wouldn't count for active recreation if it was a project over five acres. If it's under five acres, that's a it's a total moot point. So, Mr. K, I, I guess my thought is like critical areas. They'll be bound. They'll be taped off at the start of a job. No one will disturb them throughout. Mm -hmm. I think open space would be treated the same way. So if we're going to go through and dig up a detention vault mm -hmm. and plant some grass over the top, I don't know that it meets the intent of what open space is. They can still do whatever they want over the top of the vault. I, I wouldn't have you know, a problem with that. I just don't think it should count towards this number. It's not part of their open space. No. I, okay. That's I, all. That makes sense. Yeah, that yeah. that kind of clears it up for me, the undisturbed yeah, kind of. I think of another way to think of it, too, is that when we're preserving open space, even though maybe it doesn't have trees on it now, it could potentially, it could potentially mature and grow trees, and, it, and that's probably not going to happen over a vault. Probably, yeah. probably don't want it to happen yeah. over a vault. Okay. Um, so can you make those adjustments for us then, Bruce? I think we've pretty much come to consensus on he that. He's gone. <laughs> and F will be modified to just be the more passive uses? Yes, I was, well, as long as that's okay with the commission, we take out things like shelters and things like that. Is so there a reason, it would, I, I, I see playgrounds and that sort of thing, a, a shelter is, I mean, along a trail, a, a, a gazebo or something, is that something we want to discourage and is it because it's impervious surface or what is the... What's kind of, and then, I mean, we got to get into the discussion of how big the shelter can be and does it have a, I mean, I don't know. That's, that's the only thing that, that, but I agree, like if it's just a small, you know, 10 by 10 shelter, I, I, I could think, I'm, me, I, I would think you could throw it into the open space, but, but then we don't have time to get into the s specifics of how big that could be and over-regulating that portion of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's kind of just safer to leave it out. Roger. Bruce, as this is written, is this, going to create a monster for you guys to try to regulate for people who want to put a park in there or something? We have other big monsters to regulate, so this is not that tough. No, I'm sorry. Well, um, I guess maybe a little it, monster it would, that takes a lot of time. Yeah, it would be easier if it was really clear, i.e., if, okay, you either have the passive, which is this, very low level, or you have kind of that mixture in the gazebos and the, the, uh, the um, structures, and the structure is a different animal than, you know, a pathway or a bench or a table. Uh, so from a development review sp perspective, I think they'd say, hey, look, either say gazebos and shelters are okay or not. Okay, I'm good I, with that. Yeah, I think the more clarity, the better. Yeah. I'm, I'm fine with a gazebo or a shelter. It's got open space under it, and it still can interact, I think, with, with the, with the, um, ground surface around it, but I guess I wouldn't be as fired up about a big concrete slab for Agreed. You know, a, Agreed. A, a something like that. So. Could, could you write it such that it was a shelter with uh, a small shelter? We can fits establish the, a square foot. That's not a problem. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. 100 square feet I, maximum shelter, yeah, you know, right. roof area or something like that. Uh, or none. I, well, My vote is none. Okay. Just keep it out. I mean. I agree. Because we have parks I, for that. I agree because I think the objective is to keep the soil as pervious as possible. Okay. I'm also in favor of striking that too. Do we? That's three. Is I'll be number four. Okay. It just makes it. I mean, I I, I appreciate. Good. Let's move on. Shelters. And that okay. includes yeah. playgrounds as well. As long as it's pervious. I I. I think we got to keep it natural. I'm just going to keep going back to that. If I we're agree. clearing a big area and we're putting in chips, that's great, but it's not 
it, not what we're trying to do. It, right. it, it basically, it, maybe to simplify it, is when a developer comes in, they want to set aside 30% of the space. They just You just don't touch that at all. I mean, it's kind of a, right? Isn't that the mm, open space, well, I mean, essentially? It. No, I think I want passive. Yeah, I mean, trails and Oh, no, afterwards, and, but if you have to come in with some kind of machinery and to build like to build something like a playground right. or to build a shelter. You're going to have to maintain it on an ongoing, like the right. HOA will have right. to maintain it and that sort of thing, oh. but that's, that's again, a more passive, yeah, I, I think it's. So playground is struck as well, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Okay, thank you. Not that we don't like playgrounds. We got it. <laughs> we did something. We want incentives to be able to make this stuff happen, but okay, let's see. Quick, quick question. Before we yes. completely strike G, I just want to read the difference here between E and G. E reads lands used for forest equivalent service water facilities such as bioinfiltration or surface water dispersion into forest lands. And G is a little bit different. It's lands containing forest equivalent surface water facilities. If we just stopped it there, I'm curious if there's value in having lands containing forest equivalent surface water facilities and not the stormwater vault part. Here's, here's the technical thing that gets in the way is that a really well-defined vault can be designed in a way that is forest equivalent because you really neck down the, the orifice that leaves. So it can technically be called forest equivalent. So from my standpoint, um, I would, it sounds like commission really does not like G, uh, because if you're going to do the type of open type of pond or infiltration or dispersion in the forest, that's covered by um, E, and that's what really it sounds like that's what the commission is trying to do here. So the dispersion into forest lands isn't an issue? No. It, it would always that is disperse? A really okay. well that's a really a best management practice for surface land. Okay. Thanks. I, mean, I would say, too, I don't, I don't think that a vault is a, is a forest equivalent surface water facility in, in my experience because typically you hold water in the vault and you let it out through a pipe and it dumps either into a big rock pad or or a storm system so it's really in my mind it's not that's not really a forest equivalent storm facility we don't think it is but yeah. when you talk to the surface water engineering people and they start getting into that really nitty gritty detail they start talking about those things as forest equivalent it's so I would, I would prefer it to be completely gone. That makes it a lot clearer for all of us. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll have a discussion later about that. I'm gonna open this up to the commission. I'm gonna wanna take a break here eventually. Does this seem like to be a good time to take a five minute break and then to come back and then work our way all the way through this? Or would you guys like to start it before? I'd prefer to push through. All right. Okay, we'll go ahead and start, we'll, uh, I guess we can go ahead and start then making our way through this. I guess what makes the most sense is to go to page, so we're looking at draft proposal. I'm sorry, are you on the findings or the code language? Um, we should probably go through both. Yeah, I think we should go through, go through both. Hope we can get through both. <laughs> I guess we'll just have to. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, I guess we can start off with the findings then. Or actually, should we make a recommendation from uh, community development for that? Like, w which one we start with? You have commission discretion. Okay. How's that for turning it back to you? I'm going to edit. Um, I feel like, I feel like the findings is more of a, I feel like the findings is something that comes at the end and we go through the draft proposal, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's more of a baseline for our analysis. Okay, so you want to start with the findings? Okay, you can do that. That's attachment A, is that right? Well, yes. It, I'll probably take the attachment A off because it was part of the previous memo. Yeah, no, I know, but I, I'm just for reference purposes. Yeah, same thing. You know, maybe it does make a lot of sense to go through the regulations first because there's a lot of things in here that make reference to the regulations, and if you make changes, then we'll have to do it twice. 
kind of what I was thinking, but. That's kind of what I was leaning towards. Okay. All right. So start with page one then of the draft proposal. And we'll just kind of go through the pages and then we'll flip and we'll do two pages at a time and then we'll just have a limited amount of discussion uh, on things we need to get through. Okay, so page one of the draft proposal. Commissioner Cape. Just a quick question. Uh, Bruce, we're lucky to have two or more tree experts at Bothell. Um, your landscape architecture uh, background I think will help with this. But we had a memo from Andy Locke too about different types of tree varieties and a few other things. Do you do you want to weigh in? We got it at the end of or right before the meeting. I think two meetings ago. You guys got a chance to look at that. Was there anything that we incorporated or sh needed to incorporate? Or are we good? In um, most, I think, what he was after actually have been eventually through all the different uh, amendments we've done have been kind of drafted in here. Not all of them though. And I guess where I I would differ from what Mr. Locke identified was that. Um, the definitions, and we're starting on that page, these were really carefully crafted through a best available science review, and um, changes to that would not be a good idea. Uh, these are really well established definitions here. Um, is there something different that you're thinking about? Or? Well, uh, just the tree types. I mean, he included, I think, alder and cottonwood, and we excluded them, and just wanted to get. Right. Well, and consensus. again, the reason we exclude those is because alders and cottonwoods are dangerous trees. Uh, just be really blunt about that because what happens is, and like that Doug Fur or one of the others that have a tendency to grow up to a big size to, before they snap off, an alder would, will get, an, I'm sorry, an alder tree will get there in just about 20, 25 years and they snap off about 20 or 30 feet above the ground. That's where they break. Uh, and they really do become a, a liability for anybody who's living in the area. Okay, and it, just a general comment in the section. When we looked at the other jurisdictions, I think our plan that we have been working on better matches what we're trying to do. I, rather than replacement trees or, um, you know, counting it, trees in the critical area uh, or just the quantity of trees versus the size, I think what we have going here is more in line. So does anybody have any, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, did you have any response to that? I was, just just, gonna, yeah. I was just gonna identify that it sounded like you were looking for a definition for open space. From earlier, yes. I can craft something like that here if you would so desire. Give me a little bit of leeway to do it, but it basically would be along the lines of a passive type of a, a you know, a pervious type of soil. I'll use that kind of that general theme when I craft that for you. Okay, that'd be great to add in there. Okay, have you got it, Matt? Sounds good. Commissioner Wigwire. Uh, my only concern with that is open space probably shows up a lot through the code, and would we only limit it for this area? You'd be surprised at how it doesn't show up. It doesn't show up? Okay, yeah. maybe it's just been bandied there, around. There's discussion within the comprehensive of plan, but the development regulations are are more specific when it talks about recreation areas of talking about recreation area, not mm -hmm. necessarily just generally open space. Okay. But I'll, I'll make sure and coordinate that as well. Oh. See, it seems like you're the discussion we just had over the last um, 20 minutes or so, that's a pretty good definition of open space there. I'm not, do, it is. do we need to have it? I mean, this is, um, we, I mean, not every single thing in the code is defined in this definition section. Some well, of and that's exactly correct. I, I, I think we leave it in one place. I mean, if it, and if it's good where we just went through it and we eliminate that item G and that sort of thing, I think we define it in two places and all of a sudden you have an opportunity to, have conflicting. I'm seeing a lot of this, so that sounds good. Okay. Okay. So, uh, uh, pages two and three. Does anybody have any comments? I'm sorry. I have a. I, again, new to this. There's going to yeah. be. I, I gave a bunch of just minor edits to Bruce, uh, commas, and, and consistent language uh, usage. I, I was stuck in uh, forest intact uh, characteristics of conditions that predate European settlement. I. I think we could strike that clause and, and the meaning is still there with what comes in one, two, three, and four. Uh, I'm just thinking 20, 30 years from now when none of us are around and people look at that and go, what does that mean? Uh, it seems that somebody could get hung up on that. I don't know that it's necessary for the meaning of that definition. 
Only thing is I think it's pretty common in the industry. So that's probably why it's, and Bruce is talking about definitions, we've matching seen it, up with best available science. It's being used a lot. Okay. Uh, we Some of this language is stolen from some of the YRA 8 uh, okay. activities. So yeah, it's, it is kind of a generally accepted practice to identify your predated European settlement. Appreciate the comment. Let's go ahead and leave it there for now, I guess. Okay, two and three. Does anybody have any thoughts? Okay. On three, I'm wondering in the purpose section, in the first line, if we can insert intact forests before significant trees as a purpose, because we talk about that's part of the purpose of the whole open space. Well, it's more of the purpose of the clustering, not necessarily just tree retention. Okay. That just seems obvious that tree retention would also include forests, but as a, pur as a purpose rather than just trees. Hmm. I, hmm. It does seem that we're kind of, yeah, I'd, I'd be okay with that additional language because um, I know we're, we're trying to get trees all together uh, in groves or close to, maybe close to the critical areas. With tree retention though, we don't, with this ordinance, we don't tell the applicant which trees they have to save, do we, Bruce? Well, there is criteria uh, that we use, and that's basically on page, uh, hold on, on page five, line 17 and on, that's basically the areas that we try and uh, apply when we're doing the retention, i.e. Uh, you know, hey, look, we want to provide continuous tree canopies, which is kind of like a forest. We want to do preserved in groupings and all those kind of things. Um, I do kind of like that. I do, do so the commission requires a point, something along the lines that the, the clustering, I, I assume, I hadn't really thought about it much, but it, it, could, it could be broken up into a bunch of little places around the property, right? Rather than oh, just, yeah. I mean, so... I would see, I guess I would find most value in if it was contiguous, but maybe not. Maybe there's other You're talking about the options. clustering or yeah. the tree retention? Uh, the tree retention. Uh, no, the, the land open space. The open spaces. I guess we're talking about tree retention here, but. Well, I think you, it's very site specific, too. It depends on the topography and where, yeah. the, where the, the trees are and that sort of thing. I think part yeah. of the value of, of the tree retention and the clustering is to make it so that the the human-built features don't overwhelm the site. You know, that you, if you can have mm -hmm. clusters of trees throughout that, that um, kind of provide some buffering and shielding, there's some value there, too. Okay. I guess I don't have any problem with your suggestion, Dave. You have maybe a, you could, a wording you could propose so we could oh, kind of... Just, just it being a purpose of intact, just stating it as a purpose of, of the tree retention, um, it's just, I think... Ha I mean, could you? Would well, you it's just, just inserting in, in that somewhere? litany. It's not really binding on anything, but it's in that litany of things in in O and O. Is, is groves a good word? That kind of well, uh, intact forest is just a definition that's let's, just yeah. Let's right, put it in there. And, okay. and and if I may, I think maybe the retention okay. of existing vegetation, such as intact forest areas, there you go, is Sounds an good. important component of the. Great. We on Quick. four. Okay, four and five. Can yeah. I, sorry, can go back to two real quick. Yeah. Um, line 11, actually it ends up in line 13, but it talks about clustering and at the end of the sentence, thereby creating lands which can be preserved as open space. Um, should be lands which shall be preserved as open space or? Uh, it's a definition. So, um, it just looks like it's optional versus what we're doing is kind of offsetting the open space with added density, not the other way around. It's just a statement of what, what they're trying to achieve, though. How about if we do this? Creating lands preserved as open space. Yes, perfect. Oh, I like that. Yep, I see no people against that. That's a good one, Bruce, thanks. On page three.
All right, and on to pages uh, four and five then. On page four, um, line 11, Bruce, um, is the intent of this that it, that this is gonna apply to any action that's taken, not in, not limited to subdivision of land? Yes. It is? Yes. Tree retention, not clustering, tree retention. But, but any action you might take on your property other than, I know down below it says. Uh, other than the exceptions, yes. The exceptions, so it's in, even if you're, um, doing a remodel on your house, you could be subject to the tree retention requirements or is that is that covered in the exceptions? Well, if you're, if you're greater than 20,000 square feet okay. exemption okay. and your re remodel is gonna take out some trees, conceivably, yes, it would be applied. Okay, I just, okay. In line, in section D, line 23, I, I think that is referring to the application 020 section. I'm just wondering, it says applications not specifically accepted out as outlined above. Just, just confirming where that reference is. Oh, yeah, it's supposed to be C. Oh, is that C? Yeah, it's supposed to be C. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, yes, that's right. It, it helpful just to have a, yeah, I got you. So, you know, connect the dots. making our final go through this. Yeah, I get, but I think we're just asking if people have comments oh, on right. a given page, we're not reading through the thing. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, 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 correct. I'm just I'm just concerned we might be here for well, it, a few days gonna, if, we, yeah. if we read through the whole thing. My apologies, if I may. On line number 30, at the end of the statement that says, Washington State Certified Nurseman, and then it says Alan shall include in the values and trees preserved. That's actually one of the provisions of a retention. I'd like to take that out because it's just duplicating language. <coughs> take what part out? Oh. Uh, we're, we're basically on line number, well, 29 to 30, uh, where we list the type of qualified experts. And then we say a Washington State certified nursery. And then we say and shall include an evaluation of the trees to be preserved. Well, that's underneath number four below. So we kind of said it mm, twice. Okay. Yeah, that sounds so good. We just take it out. Just remove some excess language. Okay. On page five, anyway. I actually have one more comment on four. In in line thirty eight, at the end of that line, just before including. Just this, so it would read, um, you know, after during construction to insert to protect existing vegetation that um, could be retained. The purpose of the, you know, the techniques to be utilized, including but not limited to. You get into the including not limited, but not what it is. Oh, 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 oh. So just insert to protect existing vegetation that will be retained, sorry, my handwriting's not great here. Including, but not limited to, all of these things. Page five. Okay. In number one on uh, line 11, I think you want to keep shall be retained at the end of that sentence. It was deleted. You don't have a verb. and So sing with trees that shall be retained.
you deleted the last three letters. Well, it three says letters. shall be retained in E. In, at, this, at the beginning it says shall be retained. So I think the, that's, isn't that repetitive? Um, yeah. You can read the sentence without it. I don't know that it makes sense. Except for the fact that it says significant no, trees shall be retained as follows. The header, basically. Oh, got yeah. it. Okay. It says that, and then that's just, number one is just the clarifying okay. paragraph. But. Okay, and then so actually line 13, that's that's a pretty significant one, which I, uh, I'd like to open up to the, you know, the dais to people's comments on that, that number. I know we've talked about it some, uh, Commissioner Zorns. Um, I, we can talk about this later as we move, move along, but I'm not okay with 15%. I will not approve 15%. It has to be at least 20%. My heels are dug in on this one. So um, when we get to the point of authorizing what the percentage is on tree retention, um, I'm just telling you 20% is my, my bottom line on getting my um, vote on this. So whenever you want to bring it up for discussion, it's great. I think this is a good time. Seems to like discuss. that's what we're doing right now. Yeah, yeah. So any other comments with regards to that? I thought last time we talked about 15 and then there was another measure for um, getting up to 20 with either replacement or non-significant tree retention. Did that get tossed out, Bruce? You know, I, oh, in there. I started writing that in, um, but that was the height of the materials that if you remove it or use the alternative style of uh, preservation, that's in there. Are you talking about 20%? standard for retention. I think what he's, if I'm on the same page as you too, I think what he's talking about, we had discussed the option of dialing it back to 15% retention if the other 5% was maintained, was covered with smaller, uh, Smaller but yeah. well-established yeah. trees. I, I yeah. think that's what. I can what speak to that. So I don't, we're not dialing back. We're increasing it to 15, and but then we're also <laughs> saying there's a 20. There's another five percent that's required not by tree retention but tree replacement. So are you Which saying or retaining trees that are or retaining less smaller than trees than that no, would meet the exactly. criteria of a replacement? Was that not what we talked about? It is what we talked about. I thought that was like the happy medium that we came to. Yeah, I agree. So the idea behind it is that um, it's 15% of significant trees with an Existing additional trees. requirement to preserve an additional 5% of smaller trees. Is that kind of what's there? So to can make I up, summarize? To make up an additional 5% with trees that are not required to be significant trees or, or replacement trees. No, so the, so the tree retention ordinance right now does not allow or requires rather that you leave a minimum of now it's 10. We're saying it's going to be 15. You can't touch those trees unless there's extenuating circumstances. Yeah, the so there's no provision for replacement tree. You can't just take it because you want it and replace it, right? That's that's what's in play right now. Well, there is a provision that does allow you to replant new trees, and that's it's not mm -hmm. as is not but as that's remedial, that's right? Well, remedial. It is. Okay. That's so we're talking. Oh, I see. I'm we're talking. What's the regulation? So, it's okay. what we're proposing is it's 15 percent of the diameter inch inches of trees. You can't. You got to leave them. You got to protect those. And part of the conversation last time was some people were were leaning more towards 20, and so we kind of threw out this happy medium of well, if we go 15 and then require an additional 5% in either replacement trees or saving trees that aren't, you know, some of the smaller trees that would be already established and on the site, mm -hmm. but were similar to what you would do if you replaced it with a new tree. Can I thought I, that's what we had. Can I add to that? Yeah. Uh, my well, I'm just trying to summarize what we okay. kind of wrapped on last time. Okay, so where, where, where my brain was 20%. Whatever that number is of the the size, the number of trees, the quantity of tree that you have to, that you have to save, of that, 15 can be the sizable trees. 
and whatever the difference in the the diameter that you're supposed to be saving on trees can be divvied up with smaller but significant trees. Is that is that making that's making no sense? Not to me. I, I, <laughs> okay, that was on a different track, yeah. so. I think it's the same thing. Roger's saying. Yeah, I thought we were talking about 20%. If you can't get there, that last 5% between 15 and 20 can be made up with replacement trees or smaller trees that are already on site. So. Which is effectively, yeah. What so you were saying, yeah. 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 Yeah, and I guess I'm just gonna speak to, uh, uh, I guess my perspective on it. I, I, I'd like to see it 20% regardless. I mean, just 20% of significant trees. Look at these, I mean, look at these pictures of these new developments. I mean, the one we have up here, look, I mean, look Look at that. I mean, okay, so Bothell just preserved the North Creek Forest. We're trying, we have a lot of people fired up about Shelton Woods. We have a Wayne Golf Course that maybe, you know, might be say it's still kind of, you know, playing out. The people in this community want tree preservation and we, I look at this, and this is our. This was our 10%. If we if we move this to f requirement 5%, and then an, you know the additional five to get to 20, th that to me is not acceptable. So I I'm only one voice on the commission, but I sure wish we could just get to a, a, this number of 20%. I really appreciate uh, what Bruce brought. Uh, you you, but you know I, I don't want to be Redmond or Bellevue or Kirkland. I want to be Bothell, and I think the people of Bothell really want to see a lot of preservation. We're, we're planning for the future. I know we need development. I think I think developers can be very, very creative uh, in how they can create properties. This, I guess, for me, we really need this. Uh, I mean, we have this clustering incentive, but if people don't cluster, I don't want this to keep happening. And I, I'm not, 15% to me, it, to get into 20s is not acceptable. It's just. I, I mean, with regards to L, the, the LID stuff that we're trying to implement in this town and in the state, I mean, these, t these trees that are already in place, they're in place for a reason. They're soaking up a lot of water that's not ending up in their neighbor's yards or heading downstream really fast. And it's creating uh, a lot of habitat for the natural environment as well as I think a lot of things for mental health. So I don't know, that's, that's where I'm at. So I'm, I'm at 20%. Not not this 15 and an additional five. So that's just me. So I think we'll go around and vote here in a little bit, but just see where everybody is. So, Bruce. I, I, have a, I got something to add. I think we got also got to keep keep the context here. The, these neighborhoods you're looking at, this Caulfield neighborhood, has been there for built out for I think five years. Um, there were a lot of trees planted on this site. There were street trees planted, that sort of thing. They're not going to show up in a picture like this. In fact, I would argue that at the point where th that they're out on this project, they probably haven't even been planted yet. So it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit uh, early to, to look at this and say, this thing's a failure. I think you would need to look at some better better established neighborhoods such as, um, and, and a lot of them aren't even in Bothell because Bothell's a fairly young, young town in terms of the development that's going on. But if you look at Green Lake or Greenwood or these places over in Seattle that have these huge street trees that are, you know, 15, 18 inches in diameter, that's where, that's, that's the vision in the future. When the people are designing these landscapes, they're not saying we just need to, we're going to do the absolute minimum possible. It's just not possible to plant a 24 inch tree. So I think we have to look, look at the future a little bit. We also have to allow enough flexibility that that you can still have both. You can have tree retention and you can have construction. The, the higher you go with the percentage of trees that are mandatory to be to be kept, the less flexibility you have for lot layout and that sort of thing. Frankly, the le le it may result in, in less voluntary tree um, retention in, in the clustering sense. Um, I just think it's dangerous to say, these trees that are here now have to stay. I mean, if you look at if you looked at um, Green Lake 50 years ago, you saw a bunch of really tiny little trees in there. That now, if you look at the canopy, it's huge, and 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 it takes time for trees to grow. We know that. So, I think the the key. I is don't want to wait around 50 years for trees to grow up uh, in these neighborhoods. I mean, I I I don't know. I I think we can. I think we are being flexible. We're allowing a developer to cut down 80% as the significant trees to be able to put 
properties on. I think that's I think that's a lot of flexibility there. I don't know. My my idea on this is to is to is to, to be strong on this issue, and obviously council will decide what they decide on it. If it's not working out in two years, then we can revisit this and and uh, and we can reduce that number, or we or even before then. I think you have to be aware of unintended consequences of like what? doing this. Of so it sounds like we've got your opinion, and there's probably maybe five other people. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, Commissioner Cape, uh, can I just run it by Bruce? So, a couple weeks ago, I brought up the question that you know, how often has a tree stopped construction or limited a lot or impacted the developer? Can you give me a scenario now, if, if we're at 20%, a lot of times Bothell can be creative to still maintain that, but get the lot yield, I would think. But that wouldn't be the case moving forward, or tell, can you walk through that? Well, here's where it really comes together, and that's in the clustering. Uh, the clustering really is what gets us to the ability to have these smaller lots. Absent the clustering, I would be recommending not to go to a 20%, uh, particularly in the single family, because it really would. We did another of studies, oh, it was more than about 12, 15 years ago, where we were trying to increase that number, like you identified, mm -hmm. and we just could not get a 20% retention without affecting lot yield. Um, we're lucky in the single family areas, because we do have the clustering. That will really be a big change and that's what a lot of the development community have identified hey I can do a lot of flexibility here I, I'm, I'm good but um, I'm just I guess if, I guess my point I guess if mm. clustering is gonna if clustering is gonna happen I mean if somebody's gonna cluster they're, they're easily gonna cover this 20% I mean it I would be, think you're absolutely right yes so that I mean that won't even be a so but the and so the what open I'm space cluster the, the clustering open space set aside does not count towards the tree retention no, it doesn't, but I assume separate. that if you set aside, I mean, maybe not. I mean, maybe, it, but it, it, there's. Well, it does, I, if, it does if there's significant trees in that open space. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, right. yeah. The significant this, trees that are in the open oh, space. Do, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Sorry. They do count? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry, I, sorry, they yeah. do. Yeah. I'm, so I'm that's sorry. treated differently than a critical area. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Okay. Yes, Thank yes, yes. A critical area is an area that's a no touch, and you don't get to count those, but in the balance of the net buildable area, you do have to count those, yes. Okay, any of the commissioners want to speak to this? Mm -hmm. The number? I'll just, just re I'll just reiterate, I'm, I'm the 15 to 20 guy, so. Same here. Same here. Okay. Commissioner Zorn. She takes a deep breath. We've had several people give testimony tonight that they would like to see the dynamics and the complexion take a shift to support um, more moderate incomes wanting homes. And we have had a huge glut of both ends of the spectrum of housing. And so because I think Bothell needs to move into a period of strongly encouraging cluster housing, and I may lose friends over this, um, but if someone doesn't want to develop a cluster a clustered house in Bothell, I'm going to say I know that there are other people who will. So because I think Bothell needs to be, take a more aggressive, affirming hand, a more affirming hand on creating clustered homes and move into a diverse way of how Bothell looks, and the people that it attracts, so that we're attracting a diverse group of people, I am going to stick with 20%. And down the road, when there is new blood looking at this and say that this doesn't work, we need to tweak this, do, you know, it's not written in stone. But for now, I'm going to say 20%. And let's see what happens in, cre in shifting how development looks in Bothell. Okay, so that's 20%, not 20, 15 to 20%? 20%. 20%. Okay. Uh, do you all have, an, uh, where are you all at down there, Mr. Cave and McGuire? I, I'm kind of Switzerland in the middle on this one. Um, I do want to be progressive. I know that there's 10% preserved sort of on the lot lines, and I'm not talking about this example. 
specifically, but the other ones that we looked at, it looked more like zero or 1%. I mean, it, it's hard to tell with that red line because it covers up some of it, but 20% uh, is a big jump from what, you know, what we have been seeing. I think we should strive higher for sure. Um, I thought we were good with the compromise before, but there's a lot of passion around the 20% today, so. But, but um, there's a no idea, but what, how do you feel about it? It's not, it's not how the commission feels. I mean, I want as much as possible, but I, I, I'm a little leery. I don't want to create something that's uh, unattainable to be maintained moving forward. Um, so I'm still, I'm still thinking about it. Okay, commission require. Yeah, I, I, w I watched the prior meetings, and um, I, you know this is something that's probably going to be decided at the council level, no matter what we do. Um, and I, I would prefer to make a more bold statement and go with 20 percent, on the basis that it's a little bit of a carrot and stick approach. Because if clustering is what we want to do, if we want to encourage that, and a developer is going to get a nice bonus from that, um, a smaller footprint, uh, less roadway, less utilities, all those things, uh, higher density. Uh, and we have some more affordable homes, you know, that if they don't want to go that route, um, it's a diameter inches. We have a tree on our property that's just massive. I don't know if it's 50 inches across, 60 inches across, and from a diameter inches, we're not talking about saving trees here, we're talking about diameter inches. And if you have a few large trees, they're not going to look a whole lot different if you go to 10 to 15. And so by going to 20, uh, and if somebody doesn't want to go to clustering, they have to live with that. And if they go to clustering, there's a much better chance that they're going to satisfy that um, with what is in the net billable area. And, and if council wants to bring it back to 15, that's that's their prerogative. That's at least where I stand. Okay. I think we're a 3-3 three, three and... Okay. Any and Switzerland here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make good knives, though. Could I, could I just remind, remind you that it's not just subdivisions that are going to be obligated to abide by this. It may impact other properties that don't have the option of clustering. So it, 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 sure. we're looking at clustering relative to, to, to at tree retention relative to clustering, but this will have a bigger impact than that. I'm okay with 20%. I would like the, at director's review. I know we hate throwing in any type of qualifier, but I think there's going to be a rare case where it may not make sense or there may be that one outlier property. Um, but I think 20% is something that we, we should consider as a city moving forward. Um, it'll be up to the council and we can put the, uh, the split vote, but I, I think it's not that far out of line with the other municipalities that we could look at that moving forward. So you're at 20% or you're at 15 to 20? 20%? Okay. All right. So may I, may I offer one other suggestion for you? Since we're at 20%, single family, 20%, a different number for more intense zones? I, I, I might be okay with that. With regards to the downtown, I, I, that, that, that's, one thing I, I, that's one thing I think that I could be open to is in certain areas, maybe 15%. Uh, Again, we've got a good mechanism to get to the 20% within the clustering. That's not the case in our, our more active urban areas. Don't we talk, ab so bottom of page five, we talk about that. Number four, the uh, downtown core, downtown neighborhood, downtown tra transition. Um, we talk about these other ways to get up to the 15%, and maybe that's modified to to 20 or we keep it at 15 for those neighborhoods. That's an option, yes. I'm fine with 15 in the, the highly urban areas. I am as well. I am too, and I'd like to maybe expand on Commissioner Cabe's suggestion about the director's interpretation in cases where um, there's a, I guess a, what I'd call an unintended consequence to use, to use uh, Tom's words from, the, from past meetings. I'd be, I would be in favor of doing 20% with, with, a, with that sort of, I guess, fail safe, I'll call it. I'm not sure what the right word is. But. Well, the only, question, the only question I have with regards to that, I, I, I would appreciate, I mean, I appreciate that, and, but is that we got that letter from Gary Hassler, and, and they said the single most, I don't get, they needed clarification. They needed, like, concrete clarification, and, but maybe, maybe director's interpretation uh, I don't know. That's the only thing that worries me about that. They were pretty clear that they were kind of 
having difficulty squaring that away with what a developer might want to do. Yes, and we made a really strident effort to make sure we address that in the third draft that is before you. So to address their concerns. Isn't that in three, starting at line thirty? Yeah. Yes. Which I would the commissioners that were that wanted the twenty percent be willing to consider the director's interpretation side of things? For any property? Uh, for to give to give the to give the possibility that in certain situations that that twenty percent could either be made up of you know it, that maybe the twenty percent has to be there, but there's a director's interpretation. If there was some unintended consequence where it, there there really needed to be a change, that it could be done with a replacement tree or a, 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 a I'll call it a non-significant tree, two to eight inches in diameter. Bruce, didn't you tell us that Woodenville, you have to go to council to get a variation on something like this rather than director? Isn't it, were you talking about Woodenville? Redmond. Redmond Re, oh, sorry, Redmond, Redmond has yeah, to go to they, council they have a rather than. A provision for a reduced setback. Actually, they allow even increased building height, too. But, yeah. Um, that's maybe pretty bold for this situation. Uh, it's more of a joke, sorry. Right. I, I'm not really open to that, but I, don't, but I could be. Um, to Eric, to Eric had a question to to the commissioners. So. E Eric, are you proposing something, Commissioner um, Clark, something different than Section Three here, or to the hard requirement up above of twenty percent? I'm suggesting. Um, if 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 Section Three covers that. Um, then I'm, I'm fine with that if, that if that's already there. I, I would like to have some way of mitigating an unintended consequences. And if that, if, if, if everybody feels like, or Bruce, I guess if you feel like that that section three would cover that situation, then. Um, section three would cover to achieve the 20%. It wouldn't cover to reduce the 20%. Okay. Oh, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry that, that you're able to kind of do other things in the code to keep the 20%. And I'm, I think that's what you're talking about, isn't it? Yeah, Mr. Clark. Yep. I'm talking about, yeah, we're, I'm not saying we, that, that it, it's, I'm saying that it may not be that the 20% is always retained. It may be that we achieve that 20%, that there's a director's interpretation. He says it just isn't possible plant 20 new trees or go find, you know, a few non-significant trees to make up that difference. I feel like we're, G Gary's team, I feel like we're, I don't know, with that, I feel like we're maybe not giving enough clarification and firmness in the code, but I, I don't know. It seemed like they were, unless you read that, his letter differently in their day-to-day uh, experiences with that, yeah, Tom. Yeah, I think primarily Gary's concern was was relative to um, re tree retention versus new landscaping, and how new landscaping could be used to offset tree retention, even when there were healthy healthy trees that could be accommodated in the site plan. I think you've already addressed that uh, in this new draft. So I'm not that concerned about it. But overall clarity, as you all know, is going to be key to the success of going forward. So I appreciate your, your deliberation. So have we, have we provided clarity as far as you're concerned? Like, cause you're- Very much so, yeah. Okay. Very much well, so. And for sure, we know 20% within our detached residential zones. I've heard 15% in our more intense, you know, the activity centers. I believe I've heard that. And then the only thing that was remaining is where the three would be modified slightly. That, let's say, to get to the 20%, you had to lose some, or maybe a lot or something like that. We could reduce it down with a trade off with new landscaping. That's kind of what I'm, I kind of heard a little bit of that, but I'm not sure it, I got. Are you talking what, about? That's what number three is for. Correct? Well, it is kind of what number three is for, but. Um, I'm fine. I'm fine with that being the. Sounds to me like we're 4-3 on the 15. Oh, with regards to? I mean on the 20 and then 15 and the non, 
Yeah. Okay. I guess it's the it's director's the, the community development director thing is is, but so anyway, do, does everybody like the way it's written? And does it okay? The community development section three really just allows some to get change, to changes in other um, in other criteria to accommodate uh, retention of significant trees. Okay. Yes. Okay. Great. Then I'm fine with that. Okay. Anything else on page five? And I'm sorry, if I may, you know, this is a big thing. Oh, yeah. Maybe if we get maybe a formal motion, because I'm going to record that for the year findings. Oh, like to ra raise of hands? Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, motion to have it 20% and then 15%. Okay. All those in favor of? Um, well, well, it'd be a motion, of course, so. Oh, yeah. Uh, somebody like to make a motion to that? So I would motion, based on our conversation, that we go to... Um, 20% minimum required tree retention in single family zones, 15 in all other zones, and then leave number three being with the intent that that is the director's ability if there's a, an extenuating circumstance to flex on um, other codes or whatever to make a project work and still save a tree. It's a long motion. Is the only part about the motion I'm curious about is it is a single family thing really true? Is this does this not apply to twenty percent to any multifamily areas? Well that would be what commission okay. that was what okay. was discussed, but that okay. that was my summary. So if someone wants to amend the motion or second the motion, I guess it doesn't have to be seconded. Does anybody want to second the or make okay, does anybody want to second that motion? Quick discussion. Okay. Um, On the motion. Okay. So page five, four talks about RAC, DC, and DN and DT zones. That's where we're talking about the 15%. Right. So I, right? Everyone's okay with that. Is that the case? Oh, I thought we were talking about multifamily as well. Wasn't that what you mentioned? Bruce? Well, uh, that was the quote no. oh, clarifying okay. question I had. Yeah. Sounds to like someone else needs to make a motion. <laughs> I guess we'll, you're gonna rescind that motion then. I guess nobody's no, second nobody's it, so dies. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else make a, another motion? Come on, guys. Let's see fifteen. I guess I'll make a motion then. So that's not usually typical, but can somebody else make a motion? We um, move to approve the language with tree retention as written with the exception of increasing from 15 to 20 percent in single family. That's it. That's second. I, I second that motion. Okay. okay, all those in favor, uh, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Motion carries four to three. And and Bruce says, it, it, when you do talk to council about it, do you let them know it's very much of a split decision on it. Oh yes. And it wasn't overwhelming. Okay. Record that indeed. Okay, so let's move on to page uh, six then. Commissioner Wickwire. This may sound contradictory, but I'm open to relaxing the replacement of a 20-foot tree. I don't know that, um, I'm not a tree expert, but my my conventional knowledge about it, that trying to put a significant tree in as a transplant is uh, is not a always a successful approach. I, I, I don't remember, I didn't see that in the prior meeting as far the, as testimony. Yeah, I but think the previous basis for that discussion was it's a 20-foot um, coniferous tree in a, in a um, and a, a diameter of a deciduous tree. And I think the idea was that it was supposed to be difficult <laughs> to, to do this. It wasn't supposed to be pain free to be able to, to, to go, you know, if, if you are going to take a tree out as part of your construction, you're, there's going to be a. I, I understood. And I guess I, I, whether 20 feet is the right number as far as the chance that that tree is going to survive versus do you get more trees um, and, and looking a little bit more long term because you're replacing and you're look, you're just getting a look over a short term um, and whether that, that was one of the comments in the packet and, uh, you know, over 20 to 30 years um, having two trees that are more viable versus one that's 
not going to have a great start, that's a concern I'd have. I, be, I would be fine reducing that to 15 feet because that still keeps a little bit of the pain factor going on, but I, it probably gives the tree better survivability rates with weather and and, I would um, be okay with that. I had just kind structure. of mulling that over my mind as well. The 50, I would be okay with relaxing that to 15 feet. And, and if I may, unfortunately in the nursery business, trees are in two foot increments. So it's four to six, six to eight, eight to 10, 10 to 12, 12 to 14, 14 to 16. So it'll probably be 14 to 16 if that's okay. You're going back to your roots with that one, Bruce. I, yeah, many, many years. I mean, uh, no pun intended. Uh, uh, so 14 to 16, is that kind of what? Um, okay, think, so. You think in 10 to 12, or are you thinking two? I, I think it wasn't the proposal that you you can replace with two. I mean, that's not the re that it's the requirement. That it's, it, rather than having a requirement of 20, you could get there also with more trees. So maybe we keep the 20, but but allow the, I think his, his was an alternative, if I remember it. It's been a little while since I've read it. Um, that just spoke to me that um, rather than requiring a 20 foot, if they want to put in more trees. So I keep it at 20, but allow for more trees to be added if you don't do a 20 foot. And maybe the minimum is 12 or 14 feet or something like that uh, of the replacement tree, whatever, I, I guess I'd want a recommendation of what's a standard, you know, if you're putting in a, you know, a tree to a new development, which everyone knows those, those trees are gonna survive. Yeah, and a 12 foot conifer tree is a pretty, is pretty normally available for the okay. most part, so. Um, and I think the idea would be a, a one 20 foot tall tree or two 12 foot tall conifer trees. I'm fine with that flexibility, yeah. Okay, and then the other one was, of course, with the uh, kind of deciduous trees are measuring in a caliper. So we're also thinking about making it smaller there as well. I don't know what size tree that is, so. A four inch caliper is a big deciduous tree. It's about as big as usually you can get. So the idea would be that it'd be two 12, 12 two, <laughs> I'm sorry, two two inch caliper trees would in, in lieu of one four inch caliper tree. I'm fine with that. Okay. I, I'm just thinking it depends on the kind of deciduous tree that you're talking about. Because two inches isn't a very big, uh, you know, isn't a very big deciduous tree. No, I was kind of thinking three inches there for a second, but I don't know, but. Uh, for, a, for a new tree, I mean, for a, a it's a pretty good sized tree it's for a, 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 tree, a, yeah. a tree that's being planted new. Right. I, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in nurseries, but it, but if you're looking at creating a tree that's going to create a significant, meaningful landscape from the get-go, not sure two inches is going to do it. This is two inches, four feet from the ground? Um, well, a, a two-inch deciduous tree, the old nurseryman standard used to be, it was at least 12 to 14 feet in height. Um, a four inch is, oh, I can't remember, I think it's 16 to 20, but um, okay. those are the those are the nursery standards. Okay. So Bruce, can, can you clarify something for me? We're talking about replacement trees, right? So we're mitigating for diameter inches of trees that we're supposed to have been saved, but aren't, correct? Yes. So we're, we're making up a deficit of diameter inch inches. So how do you equate, let's just say, we gotta make up 13 diameter inches. We're over on our, so how do you, how do you equate a 20 foot compared to a 12 foot conifer to a, to a diameter inch? Well, Does it have an associated diameter inch to it? I, I'm just, you guys yeah, are having to enforce yeah, this, so how do um, we? How do you t figure out how many trees they need if you're and, and using that, heights? You're right, and that's the challenge with going with conifers because they are measured as a height, not a caliper. Um, and then, how much does a new tree count for? The actual inches it is when you plant it. So you get two inches for a two-inch tree. I would I, I just I, I guess I want us to be able to connect the dots so that somebody yeah. knows what they have to yes. I would rather go with a height minimum for conifer trees. Okay, uh, but I guess my question is when we're going with the evergreens and it's a two inch and you you owe eight inches, 
Does that mean you have to go four two inch trees or two four inch? How are we doing this? How are we calculating this? I think he's just yeah. saying that a tree 20 feet in height would satisfy the. Satisfy what? Would satisfy what if you the replacement owed, what if you What if you had to replace 24 inches? I don't think that's the way it's written, at least not the way I read it. It's, it's, it's a deficit, one significant it? tree is replaced by two deciduous or one 20 foot conifer. It doesn't necessarily, you're not getting the full 13 inches of that tree you just described back. You're getting two small two inch trees or a four inch tree, depending on how we write this. You're, okay. So if, 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 if they say they're gonna preserve a 13 inch tree and then for some reason they can't and that dies or it's taken down during construction, their replacement is currently written as a 20 foot conifer or a four inch caliper deciduous tree measured four feet from the ground. No matter how many diameter inches the tree that you're taking out is. Yes. Yeah, diameter inches okay, are so irrelevant not, for the replacement. So we're not, we're going away for, we're doing that for the original calculation of what you gotta retain, but after that, then all bets are off, then it's hmm. just this. Right. Which, oh, which okay. is why we had the 20 foot yeah. and the four inch to yeah. have it, it yeah. cost a little bit more for the developer. Yeah. If, if they, so we don't want them to do it intentionally. No, I understand that. I, I'm just I'm looking at the mechanics of the code and mm -hmm. making sure that you guys, when mm -hmm. somebody comes with a project, know what you're telling this guy to, or gal to, that they have to do. In in my opinion, it's it's tricky to do it right, but I don't think that having two two inch trees or a what 14 to 16 foot conifer to replace a significant tree is is enough, depending on how significant the tree is. I think and that's, that, I guess that's my point. Yeah, I yeah. completely agree. So maybe we're going back to the language of stands because it's, it's a, the, yeah. it's a yeah, strong if, deterrent. If I think let's that's, just say you have to save 40 inch diameter and you can only do, for whatever reason, you can only do 25. There's 15 left that you should have saved that you didn't. And so is that what we're shooting for, for replacement? 15, and that could be a combination of different sizes or whatever, or is it just, hey, you didn't make it, you gotta plant this 20 footer. And do they, do they pay the, the fine for the tree that was bonded? Or how Not it? usually, no, usually the idea is to put the trees into the landscape, because that's what has the visual effect. Um, maybe maybe a, a, maybe it's kind of a one 20 foot tree and, and then the additional inches that you took out can be in, in other trees, you're getting one, one big tree and then whatever the additional diameter is, you're getting it, that equivalent diameter in however many trees it takes. It's, it's kind of funny because this is exactly how we got to the 15 to 20 yeah. point last time. We thought, what if somebody has trees that didn't count toward the significant tree count that they're preserving and then through construction, whether it's intentional or not, a tree comes down. Do we want them to plant new trees or would it be better off for them to preserve existing trees and, and use those to the count, maybe something that hadn't been taken down before. It's kind of what led us there before. I think at this point it's too late to, to go to other existing trees. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not proposing yeah. that. I just think it's, it's interesting this that says, we're having the same conversation again. Because this assumes that you've already, you're already into your development process, you're already doing your construction, and so which would, which would presume mm -hmm. that you've set aside all the safe trees mm -hmm and then you've taken out all the trees you're going to, so the opportunity to dedicate other trees is probably not there anymore. They've probably already been removed. But if you clustered and you had an open area that had some trees in it that didn't count toward your significant trees, mm -hmm. then you could just use those yeah, instead. Yeah, if they were the two to eight yeah. inch diameter. Yeah, I think that's, but again, that that is making it easy. Um, right. um, so it's so easier for somebody to, to break the rules. So I'm looking at, at the bottom of page five, number four. Okay, this is a provision for RAC, DC, DNDT zones, okay, where you gotta, you're required to preserve 15, but may implement the following alternative tree retention practices, okay, right. and that's what we're talking about, this 20 inch, this kind of stuff. So it's not necessarily during construction. This is part of a planning process, right? Mm -hmm. That section gonna, is. Yes. This, but that's the section we're talking about. No, we're talking about section. Oh. We're talking about section F. That's uh, section E. Good, good, good clarification on that one. Uh, or excuse or, me, G. We're talking about G, and that's section. I'm not talking about. I'm, no, wait, G. no, I think we I'm were on. on the, I'm, 
We're talking about the 20 foot tree, right? Yeah, which is that's section oh, G. In two places. Which would it's be page yeah, six. Oh, it is. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at page I'm looking, six in the downtown walk. I'm looking at page seven eight. under the 20 foot tree. Hmm. Well, maybe they're both the same. Maybe it's 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 a replacement mechanism, and it's maybe it's the same for both. I don't know. I'm I'm concerned. But there's two different situations. One is there's we're in a RAC zone or whatever, and we want flexibility, so we're offering uh, as an alternate to re retaining a tree. We're offering the ability to mitigate for that by replacement. And so then, what does that number become? How do you translate that to how many trees have to be? The other one would be during construction. I just don't want it to be so, I, I mean, I, I appreciate the development community doing the right thing, which they, which I'm sure they usually do, but I don't want to make it so watered down so that if, if there's an inconvenient tree that it comes down and they're able to replace it with you know, two smaller trees without having to pay any kind of bond or anything. So that, that's, that's the concern I have. Tom. Well, if I can make a couple of comments, uh, I was just, I was just chiding Bruce here a little bit uh, uh, for getting in deep. The, keep in mind that the direction from the city council was to work on clustering and make any changes that may result from that in, in the tree retention landscape co code, as well as staff, our team, brought forward some issues that we have had with the development community on on interpretation, so we wanted to clarify those. The mission was never to address all of the landscape code, and maybe, but maybe we should someday. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're not really able to give you our best professional advice because we haven't gone through the entire landscape code. Uh, we can uh, at some point if we're given time and direction to do that, but we're not capable tonight. So maybe what you're thinking is maybe we just leave this as is because we've had several meetings where we talked on this. Yeah, I mean, we I, did just I, change another part of it. I but appreciate your deliberations very much, but but you know you're uh, you're not going to you're you're venturing into some areas mm -hmm. that um, you may regret later and without a whole comprehensive re redraft of the whole landscape code. Okay. So would everybody here be fine with just leaving it at 20 foot, feet as we had it before? To, as a strong deterrent to remove significant trees? Okay. I, I guess so. I'm nervous that we've changed a bunch of language already. I mean, we, <laughs> I mean this isn't yeah, I the first area. Yeah, my question no. is, Tom, are you talking about just this issue or the, or the entire discussion up till now? Well, uh, probably just this issue. I mean, uh, I, I I, you know, Gary, I don't know how far Gary's comments really led us into this path, but, but uh, uh, if, if you can, you know, I think if you can uh, keep in mind that uh, the, the clustering is really focused on preserving trees and how, and how we can incentivize that uh, in site plan review, so much the better. Uh, uh, and, it, and I think it's just especially critical for the community where, where there's a conversion of uh, semi-forested or forested areas in, into n new neighborhoods. That's where, you know, that's where the friction is. So uh, please work on, on whatever, needs, okay. whatever needs to be done mm -hmm. for those areas. Uh, but bear in mind, you know, it's going to be, you know, it, it, we would we would approach this. I'm sure Bruce would approach it much differently if if the assignment was go through the whole landscape code and modernize it and, and make it make it fit the policies of the current comprehensive plan. Okay. If that makes sense. Could I, yes. could, could I make a suggestion? It seems like we've got two areas where the 20 foot tree is, is discussed. One is in a kind of a more voluntary pre-construction point. That's section um, um, four. four. 
and then there and then there's one that's more uh, I don't know if this is the right word but kind of punitive in nature where you've you've taken out some trees that you clearly were not, were supposed to retain and and maybe maybe on the one where it's more voluntary it's or or planned it's 15 feet or 14 to 16 feet but we make it more difficult on the on the ones that deliberately I would say deliberately broke the rules and make keep that at 20 feet and um, and maybe it should be two trees at 20 feet under this section because I notice here it's one um, and over here it's two if I'm not is that right so on page seven it only uh, it only suggests replacement of coniferous trees shall be a minimum of 20 feet No, it is too new. It is too new. So it maybe we two, keep it at yeah. 15 and 20. And th that way it's, you're not punishing the person that can't make their site work for, for uh, the, the full percentage on, the, on these higher density zones, but you are kind of punishing the person that broke the rules deliberately. I, I, go ahead. Yeah, I'd support Commissioner Clark's changes. Um, I care, I guess, a little bit less about the 20 or 16, 14 feet. I just want to make sure my understanding is correct. With um, number four, they're basically, I mean, you could cut down any tree on the site and replant in order to make up that difference to 15%. So what we're giving in those areas is just sort of a carte blanche. You don't necessarily need to protect any trees. We want you to. but. If you can't, then you can do these alternative methods. So that's that's more what I'm focused on. I, the the exact specifics yes. on how big the tree, yeah, not big. So is everyone okay with with that part of it? Yes. And I was only clarifying that keep the 20 feet. But if you don't want to do 20 feet, you have to do actually more trees because this is a per tree. And if you did do the 20 footer, still keep that as the rule. But I think that is the point made is that you'd have to do more trees if you didn't want to do a 20 footer in this planning process. I would keep the, 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 I wouldn't change the other part. And so I agree with Commissioner Clark on that. The punitive part of, of a tree that's lost during construction. So we're damage. talking 20 here on page six and 15 on page seven, is that right? Uh, it's, or, I think it's 20 in both, but what, what I was proposing okay. is extra trees. If you don't want to do 20 feet in that planning process, instead of doing one extra conifer tree at 20 feet, you could do two at 14 to 16 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically the idea is that the smaller the trees you install, the more you have to install. Because they have to be spaced. I mean, there's rules about yeah. spacing and all that. So it just means that... It, it Do you want to make a motion on, to, with regards to that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I move that, that section four, um, dealing with RAC, DC, DN, DT, the planning, that, that, that keep the language there, but there's um, in each of these the ability to, if you, they didn't do a 20-foot tree, that they could do an additional two trees that are at least 14 to 16 feet height in height on the conifer side. And maybe we go with three inches on the deciduous tree. I don't, Bruce is the expert on caliper size of deciduous I'll, trees, I'll, but I'll. that would be my motion. If they want to do two smaller deciduous trees in, in addition, in, 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 instead of doing the one larger tree. Second. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Uh. Opposed? Okay, it passes. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Tom. Uh, let's see here. So it's it's uh, 8.35. So maybe if any commissioners need to take a break, feel free to do it. But I think we'll just keep going. Can I ask a quick question yes. from Tom since he kind of gave us a little pep talk? Um, are, so are, we, are you r suggesting that we kind of just back on out of the tree retention stuff now and move into the clustering? Is that... Kind of what I got from your comment. Well, I certainly didn't um, <laughs> certainly didn't mean to to uh, imply that you're going over overboard. It's it it was really more to make sure that we had we had the right um, direction in focus. Yeah. No, I think you did a great job, of that. Okay. I, and I appreciated your comment. I guess I'm just are, are we. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's done with it anyway. Yeah, the, at the group, yeah. I think you're. The last page. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pages eight and nine. Any comments? All right. When, real quick, eight and nine, just because we're on them. When we get into clustering later, I'm going to propose that we include some sort of landscape buffering when we switch to an attached product um, with the 
40% open space requirement. Rather than just the additional five foot setback, I don't want to do type one, but type three or five may be applicable for that situation. Okay. All right. Page 11. Shouldn't be any changes there. Uh, let's see here. 12 and 13. Can I suggest that if people don't have something written down, a comment written down, that we just move, keep moving? I mean, it, we, or if you do have a comment, blurt it out. Okay. <laughs> you got two seconds or so. Pages uh, 14 and 15. 16 and 17. I have a comment on page 17. Okay. Bruce, were you going to say something? I was just going to mention that uh, 123070 permits and uh, clusters, that's all supposed to be underlined. So just so you know, it's all new language. It's not for some really, really weird reason for. On which page? On it's all. Page 16. Oh. 12.30.070 permits. Yeah, that's all new language. So right. it will be underlined okay. when you see the next version, just so you don't okay. think okay. that somehow it's existing language. The question on page 17, item E, which is line six, but down on line 16, so E4, I, I would like to see that roundup provision apply to um, uh, lots, uh, either all lots or say two to two to nine lots instead of four to nine. Commissioner Cade. Uh, I think I'm in the minority here, but I don't, I don't like the roundup provision at all. I would like a minimum, um, I'd be okay with extending it to fewer lots but I'd like a minimum open space required instead of a number of lots. Because if we're talking 5,400 at two lots, that's really no, very little open space preserved. So essentially like a free up zone almost? Well, I'd, I'd rather just define however many square feet we think open space is constituted and do it that way. Because I, I would agree, if it was two lots on 40,000, that makes sense to me, but two on 5,400 doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, so I think it should be on a, a square foot basis of what we're setting aside. I Can guess I, I ask, okay. w what, would, what would you recommend for minimum? I don't know. I mean, I think it depends. I mean, we're talking about clustered forests and if we're, we've got 2,000 square feet in. Is a stand of like two or three trees? Is yeah, that, I mean, I don't know like that, that that gets us. Give us any benefit or? Get this there. It's hard. We're trying to meet the feathered edge. There's a lot of other objectives that tie to clustering, and it's a good thing all around. I just want to make sure that the intent is matched, and that's. So yeah, I'm open to hear, you know, other people's opinions. It's hard to throw a square foot at it because each lot, every tree stands different. But I think that's dangerous. I think there's can, unintended consequences of that. Can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. Are you are you talking about uh, the the f the footprint of the physical construction? No. Uh, because of amount of covered surface. So, so would you be open to allowing more if the units were smaller? Mm, yes, but that's probably a different topic. But I'm I'm more concerned with kind of the intent of clustering is open space preservation so what how do we define that and to me we get into some small small numbers at two lots we're talking a thousand square feet and I think that's I, I don't think that's what we're trying to to do here um, I can see two lots working on a bigger parcel for sure I just I, I agree that maybe setting an arbitrary number that's gonna have unintended consequences but I also think going just with a baseline of two is going to have kind of the same issue. What do you mean by two? What are you What are you referring to? You said change from four to nine lot. Or two to nine. Oh, two to nine. Okay. Or, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the going other, from I would two actually to nine. be more in favor of just allowing the 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 density bonus to apply on any size of project. I mean, if I if it's a five lot project, you can potentially get another lot out of it by by. Let that density bonus criteria apply. So if you set aside. 25% of the site in open space, then you would get a 20% bonus, which would be another lot, right? 
So can I insert real sure. quick? Um, so I think what Pat's saying is there's a, there's a side, so if you've got a 5,000 square foot lot and you're gonna set aside 10%, that's a 500 square foot open space. And how much value does that have? I think is what you're saying. Yes. And so is it, does that really need to be more the factor of how small we determine our project is uh, uh, or, or is it something else? But I guess maybe what I could throw in in addition is if, if it's contiguous with another open space, that maybe even if it's 500 square feet, it would make sense, mm. right? Because we're just trying to add wherever we can. Um, but that's another kind of, that's another avenue in the code that you have to create. Yeah, I agree. Yes, Bruce. If, if, if I may, one of the reasons why the four to nine made a lot of sense was that that's where you do have that ability to create some some synergy with your open space. And again, I go back to the 9600 one. This is only a one acre parcel, and yet we're able to save, you know, uh, you know, almost almost 30% of it as an open space by doing a very simple, uh, you know, access tract and four, five lots along here, and then you got this area that's preserved as open space. That's the whole concept behind clustering. Not necessarily, and I, and I don't know that we really need to say this has got to be a certain dimension or a certain square footage because logic dictates that when you start clustering, you're going to take advantage, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. You're going to take advantage of the ability to reduce your infrastructure, your mm -hmm. roads and your streets and your utilities and all those things by making it compacted into that area. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't make sense to, you know, have a little hairy here and a little hairy here and a little hairy here, even though you could do that it's not gonna really get, achieve the effect that you're after. But um, that's why the four number made sense across the board with re the zones. I did a, and I only have the R40,000, the R9600 example for you, but here's the R40,000 designation uh, example, which, you know, you go to five and man, you're, you're, you're there, you're creating some really significant open space. But why um, wouldn't you just, why wouldn't you just, instead of doing the roundup, just use the density bonus? Cause, well, and, and you could. If, because it, cause if, if, you, the, if, you if you dedicate 30%, you get a 25% density bonus, is that right? Yes. 25% density bonus on a four lot project is one lot. So, right, I, I mean, yes. So that would be another way to do it. You say, okay, well, if you're gonna do the smaller lot process, and again, we were trying to come up with a really easy way to make the smaller lot process work. Uh, it's gonna be a 25%, because that's what you'd have to do to get you'd have to do, a yeah, bonus. You'd actually have to do 30%, I think, to get 25%, right? Isn't that's it? correct, yeah, so, 30%. So on a four lot plat, if you wanted to get a, a bonus lot, you would have to dedicate 30% of the site to open space, which is significant. That's a, a, that's a, a four lot plat's gonna be an acre, so 30% of that is, um, well, that's what this is. This is 33 percent. Third of an acre. Yeah, but I mean, I'm saying it's uh, uh, on a on a square footage basis. That's 14,000 square feet or something like that of, of open space. So maybe we should just simplify it and say, let's forget about the rounding up altogether and just let the let the uh, the, the let the density bonus apply everywhere. And by definition, it wouldn't apply to anything that was less than four lots because you couldn't get a bonus lot on a three lot project, right? Because a 25% density bonus on three lots doesn't get you to another doesn't lot. Doesn't get you another lot. So we just leave it as, as any project, one through a million lots, this thing applies to, but it, it just does, the calculation doesn't work for anything less than four lots. Is that correct? Bruce, that's right, yeah. That yeah. is correct, okay. That, that's, how that, that's how the mathematics work anyway. That, that simplifies it significantly. Then you don't have to worry about this rounding up for certain projects and not for others and density bonus for certain projects and not for others. Is, thir is, is a third of the site set aside, a third of an acre set aside for open space for a, a bonus lot worth it on these smaller projects? I think it is considering how many of these smaller lots are out there. I just wonder how how it affects the neighborhood to round it because that could have that could because having this I mean it's I like the intent of it I think it could there's a we're talking about a lot more areas clustering is a good thing I, I I'm not sure if it's good everywhere but maybe it is but I don't know if anybody else has any thoughts on that I mean 
at, at a certain level, because then you start getting into, you know, neighborhoods maybe where, you know, you have a bunch of new houses kind of pushed together near the, I mean, it really could change a neighborhood, I guess, well, it, on a small scale. But they're gonna get the benefit of having, there, right. may, there may be smaller lots, Depending on which size homes, of you're, you're on. gonna have a bunch of area that doesn't yeah. have houses yeah. on it too. Commissioner Zorns? Uh, unintended consequence is if we have narrower roads, that means we probably may have parking on one side of the street, right? So I guess my concern is that we could be easily looking at imposing the streets of Seattle into our own neighborhoods, like the problems that we have on 104. We need to be very cautious about hitting critical mass People want their cars, they're gonna need their cars. Where are they going to park if they can't park here? So my only word of caution is, is that we're look, as we're looking for density bonuses, you know, we haven't even talked about backyard setbacks because we've talked about adjusting that in previous conversations with this. We haven't talked about height, we've talked about that in previous conversations. And then the other component is, where are people gonna park? You know, you might have one parking spot per unit. So, you know, oh, I, I, I think we just need to be, I, just, I think we just need, really need to be cognizant that that there there's a ripple effect with our density mass and just make sure that we do not hit critical mass and affecting both this this development and the surrounding neighborhood. The, the code specifies a certain number of parking spaces oh. per Per, per unit though. Oh, I know it does. And so you it, can't go less than that. I know it does, but the, but the more compressed that we put, that we create here, our head count for cars are going, are going to go up. And possibly a reduced street why? Because and you're sitting aside. I, I, I see and that. So people are going to go that. park around the corner in the other neighborhood, but and so I just, I just, not that I'm arguing against this. I'm just right. saying we need to be really cautious about how dense we do go and what ha what the ripple effect is it, of it is. Can, can I ask? Yeah, so Bruce, th in this scenario, is this road that you're showing does this meet development standards, or is this a it reduced? Does. Okay, it does so print it's development standards. They could do this road whether they had bigger lots or smaller lots. Right. Okay. It'd be the same, the, the, the road section in this area would be the same. And it's basically a 20, I'm sorry, 22 foot wide road that gets back there for the fire department access. That's what these smaller projects do. It's just basically it's a tract that they provide access through. If I may, I, I'm open to the proposal because this is really not about zoning and classifications. It's really about the lots that exist. And so, um, if a developer has a bigger space to work with, then they can be in that bonus calculation. And so that could be right next to somebody who has a one acre that would do the same thing. And they may have, in the, in the question is, if they have the same zoning, why do their different rules apply? Just about what the lot yield is based upon the ownership of that particular developable property is the point. Um, because again, you could have a, um, a project that is just a you know a five acre like up on West Hill there's a ten acre uh, lot up there and then if there's a one acre next to it um, the person who has the ten acre could get into this bonus category calculation but the person who's at get just the one acre that's going to sub they have the same zoning but they're going to have a different result even though they're right next to each other so it's not a zoning thing it's a who owns the lots and what sizes they are. Yeah, it's a lot configuration situation. It's a lot configuration, not it. And so I guess I'm, I'm open to that, that, that calculation. Commissioner Cape. I think I like the change Commissioner Clark made. Um, Bruce, could you just in the follow-up send a, an example on a 5400 development, just the minimum open space preserved, just so we can get a feel for on the far end of the spectrum because I think when we're looking at an acre lot and we're looking at our 9600, totally makes sense and I would agree. But if we're looking at you know, 5400 oh, or... For the small lot kind yeah. of a... Con oh, I'm sorry, yes. I think we can do that pretty easily. Um, so you're open to you for that? And then one other quick question. Um, so if you preserve 40% and you can go to an attached product, I think increased density within development is, is a good thing in opening up free space. but. Would that be a, applicable, like in an R9600 development that 
on a one acre parcel, you could put five units attached um, if you set a set a uh, set aside forty percent. Forty percent rule would that be? Because when that, we're thinking about feasible? it, we're talking about big, you know, ten acre parcels. But this is applying everywhere, so. I know there's going to be a theory. In theory, you might be able to, but don't forget, we also have the additional increased setback requirement. We're going from to 30 Wait, feet so instead of the so 20 feet. So you might build, start in a smaller in a smaller scale. Yeah. You might start running out of land there. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying an attached so product, which we're codifying, is okay. And uh, um, I think we talked about. When we were talking about affordable housing, we talked about potentially allowing a duplex or something like that. Is that what you're talking about or something different? Well, later as we get into the packet, we allow attached products if you set aside 40%. So if you have 40% open space, then you can have an attached product regardless of the zoning. So 9,600, 5,400, doesn't matter. But you still have the same density calculation? Yeah, same density calculation, but it can go to attach. And not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just wondering in these small one-off neighborhoods, developers probably aren't going to choose the attached because it's going to be a yeah. less expensive market. Less value, yeah. um, but just wondering how would we would affect the neighborhood. Okay. Anybody else have a comment? So yeah, Eric, you want to restate what you're? Yeah, how about if I just? Yep. Can I just make a motion? That sounds good to me. I think okay. we're good. Yeah. I would make a motion that on page 17, item E4, which is line 16, that that be, that the roundup provision be eliminated and that the density bonus simply apply to all sizes of projects, of PUDs. Second. Okay. <laughs> All the, so, so okay, yeah, so, yeah. I can clarify if yeah, you clarify want. That this just is outside little, the yeah, motion, yeah. but that would mean that there would be no bit density bonus for lots smaller than, uh, projects smaller than four lots. Just the, that's how the math works out. So all we're changing this to is, is instead of four to nine lots okay. getting the roundup, four and up get the density bonus. Okay. Yeah, all those in yeah basically four would, the, the, the section four would go away and section five would be, we'd take out the number 10 so you were basically line 21? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we'll just take that out. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, uh, raise your right hand. Aye. Opposed? Okay, passes. Okay. And so we're pushing on nine. Bruce, with regards to going past nine o'clock, do I need to, do we need to have uh, an extension? What, you, what you'd do is you'd have a motion to extend the meeting to us. You know, give yourself whatever time you think you need. Can I have a motion? On the dais. How, how much further, how close are we to the end? Uh, is there a chance we can get this done? I mean, there's there's only a couple, three more pages that have red on them, and then. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to finish by nine. I think I'd like to, if somebody has to make a motion to, if we finish by nine, we can finish by nine, but. I think the question is, are we going to finish in a reasonable amount of time past nine, or do we need to come back a different day? Uh, we got to finish it tonight, I think. What we could do is that you could complete your code amendment language. Because findings are findings, and that you can review that in a different later meeting if you so desire. Okay, so I move to extend the meeting to 9.30. Second. All right. Do we have to take a vote on something like that? I can, all those in favor of extending the meeting, say aye. 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 Can I ask a quick follow-up to Commissioner Clark's motion? Yes. Um, so page 18 near the top talks about all cluster PUDs provide for a minimum of 10% of the net buildable area of the site to be placed within a dedicated forest. Um, so is there a threshold of 10% and then that 30% 30, 30 would kick in and then that's where you would get your other lot? I, I think the, I'm not sure what you're asking, but 10% is the minimum, right? Right. And then and then you can go, you get a, you get a bonus for up, up to, if you keep going up with your percentage, you get a bonus starting at 15%, at right? Yes. So the idea is that any cluster has to provide at least 10% of the net buildable area as an open space area. Uh, to get to the bonus provisions, you have to increase the number, amount of open spaces preserved. And so what the, the scenario that you guys have just, the commission has just identified would be 
that uh, for a small project, they'd have to provide significant amount of open space as part of their project to get the bonus. You'd have to provide 30%. Yes, 30%. To get anything foreign. Foreign higher. Yeah. Okay. Can we get a new table for that or some, some just to look you, at it all I can get later. you anything you Thanks. want. <laughs> okay. Well, almost. Okay. So the motion carry to extend the meeting to 9.30? Yeah. I please. Yes. Yes, it did. Okay. I didn't, I don't think we asked for it. Oh, oh uh, all those opposed? Aye. Okay, so there's one in the, uh, one in the negative, so it okay. extends the meeting. Uh, let's see. Uh, anything else on that page? Can I ask a question? It might be a, on page eight, 18. Okay. Line five, is there a reason, Bruce? I mean, there's no, there's no incentive for, there's no bonus density for a 10% set aside. That's correct, that's the so do you So why do we have that in there if there's no, do you think people are just gonna do that? They have to. Yes, if you do it. Well, they don't, if they don't do a cluster. I mean, right. I, my no, point is we're right. trying to get people to do clusters and. Yeah. Can't you get other things besides an additional? I mean, well, you get, you get, you get other the benefits. reduced roadway Side. infrastructure, you get the smaller lot area, yeah. you get all those things. Okay, yes. that you can't do in a There are other exactly. benefits, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Can, I, can we just go back to page 17? Uh, there's just two in section um, on line 15 and line 21. Bruce, just consider whether those two mays should be shall, shall be credited towards the lot yield calculation and shall be permitted versus may. I just don't know the use of may there. Okay. Seems correct, yeah. And on, on page 18, uh, it may be helpful in section J, uh, there are multiple references to net buildable area. I'd made these comments a, two weeks ago when I read this, but um, I think it's calculated pursuant to section E1, and I just wonder whether we just connect the dots on that, so we're... Reference E1 or something? If that's, if that's correct. Um, because it's, it's the reduced net buildable area because you're excluding uh, critical areas. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, that's the definition of net buildable area. Right, but but reference back to, it's it's the effectively the adjusted it. net buildable area, not just to make sure it's clear from interpretation standpoint. And so, it is what do you mean adjusted? Well, sorry, net, um, yeah, sorry, net buildable area, um, we're, we're, we're redefining it in this ordinance as excluding open space, or sorry, excluding critical areas. So it's the. It already does. The, it already does. It already does exclude. Yeah, if you look up at E1 on line six. No, all I'm saying yeah. is just make a reference. I'm not saying it's change. It's just in the. It, it, oh, I see what you're saying. Net billable area has another understanding elsewhere, right? No, it's nope. critical areas are always outside of the clustering. Yes, other than net buildable area. Always. Okay, well that's my ignorance. So, so net buildable area would always be, I thought there was a significance to how we're kind of adjusting what a net buildable area would be uh, in this code section. Nope. Or not. I don't think so. Okay. One other quick note on 18, <clears throat> page or num line number six and seven and 11 and 12. We have the same definition twice. Let's just make that consistent and I wanna make sure that encompasses everything that we're trying to preserve or all the open spaces. We get sort of specific, but then again, we have the uh, surface water facility included in there. So that should either be scratched, the surface water facility, um, because we're taking it out in the, previous sections. I am really sorry, what I got lost there. 18. I, taking out bolts, right? uh -huh. I know, but this. Surface water. A surface water facility sounds like a vault. It doesn't sound it's like a. Line six and seven and 11 and 12, yeah. I guess. The forest, it's the. It's the forest uh, equivalent surface forest water. Forest equivalent, which would be like a rain garden or a dispersal trench or something like that. Or, right. Or which we're not taking out. Correct, previously Bruce said that some stormwater vaults are considered a 
uh, forest equivalent. Are, so that's that, why we that took it out. Is, now that G is gone. G is completely gone. This you is got it book, You have to go to the um, uh, uh, E, which is biofilm infiltration or forest dispersal. That's so. Now what will happen is that will. This will specify what that means. Okay, yep. perfect. But I, I, yeah, I hear what you're saying, so it's a good point. Okay. Anything else on uh, 19? I would add um, a thought at the end of 3C on line, is it 24? Uh, comma, it, it, right in that parenthetical after tract, as approved by the city attorney. And sorry, in, in 3B2, at the end of that, after restriction, I would add in the designation. I'm sorry, what was, what was I'm the sorry. page and line number? Again? Sorry, I'll, I'll start again. Page 19, oh, I'm, going, okay. I'm going backwards here. Sorry, let's start with 3B. I would change the word format um, to form approved by the city attorney. Just get rid of a format and say in form approved by the city attorney. At the end of 3B2, I would say of the restriction in the designation, because it picks up what's above. And then the end of 3C, where it says, and protection of the tract, I would insert comma as approved by the city attorney. And then in, um, I have a question of what the purpose of D is, and I'm looking at that again. Um, Bruce, do we typically have the city attorney look at the plats and stuff? Well, what happens is we have common language that's been approved by the city attorney. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and we just plug it into our, our projects. Um, same page, page 19. Lines 33 through 37 talk about the attached dwelling unit um, and the distance from the perimeter. I'd add a landscaping buffer just because I, and a minimal one, so like I said, either three or five, uh, just to add some blockage between a single family uh, development and what will now be an attached. Yeah, and staff would recommend a type three because that's what is against a commonly used between single family and multi-family type threes. So, so we're limiting people's ability to have a, a yard? Well, then? it's only five feet wide. A type three is a five foot wide. So of their 20 foot backyard, they're losing five feet of it to a yeah. landscape buffer? I mean, I, I thought we were setting it further back well, specifically it, it, to give that buffer. Yeah, attached, uh, attached basically, five feet you or 10 to feet. have a 30 foot setback. Uh, what Commissioner's Cave is identifying you're going to have the 30 foot setback plus a landscape buffer, basically a, a site, not a site screening type buffer. That's what basically a type three is. So basically, if it's a two or less, you don't have to have that landscape buffer. Is that right? Yeah, correct. Right. And if it's a duplex or something, duplex, you wouldn't need it, but three or more. Yeah, it's three or more. Yes, correct. Yes. Okay. I see. Uh, what's the feelings on the dice about that, or is, is it? I'm fine with it. I'm okay with that as well. Same. Okay, great. Uh, Go ahead with that, Bruce. In line 32, I think that should be reference subpart J, so 070 J not. Yeah, you're right. Okay. That was one of the things I identified. I said, oops, that's the wrong one. Of course, it'll be different again when we finish. Okay. All right. Page 20. 21, okay, pages 22 and 23, and uh, pages 24 and 25. Uh, on page 24 mm -hmm. in section C there at the top, this would be in line probably in line eight. Do we need to reference the open space designations there? I'm sorry, I've got to catch up. What page are you on? 24. 24. 
line uh, eight. Line eight-ish, but it's section C, just having a reference to the open space designations that are created to be in the property records. Including all of its open areas and recreational facilities? Uh, it, it, it's, um, yeah, proposed final conditions, covenants, I can't, it, it's, it, we're the best place to put it. Um, yeah, that might be after recreational facilities. Um, we just need a reference to the open space designations that are in, that need to be kind of put in place. That seemed like a logical place to put it. Is, is that different than the open areas? Yeah, it's a, specific there's specific designations that are burdens now that are recorded permanently that this land can't be developed. That's part of the process of that other change. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's the legal change the terminology of the open areas? Just change the open space, space for open, open areas. areas. Yeah, I don't think this was um, open areas. I think this, is, this language hasn't been revised yet, I don't think. It's not been looked at so for many I, years. Yeah, yeah. And so I think we, because we're adding a, a legal requirement, we just need to reference the open space designation, which is the thing that's on page 19 in the, you know, and, and if I may, I think what we'll do is after recreational spaces, just include open spaces pursuant to 1230070. Yep. And that way we got to tie back into it. Yep. Perfect. Are we taking out open areas then? Or no. is that, is no, that open something areas, different? Open areas. Because we have now five different types of planned unit developments. And some of them do actually have gotcha. open areas. So okay. that works. In, in section F that starts on 14, do we need to add a new category six for clustered subdivisions? PUDs, blah, blah, blah. Oh, now we're in 14. Back to page 24, section F. Oh, line 14. Work up a new, so it would be, it would be at line 25 that's blank right now, but add a new. Don't we need to just think about that, whether we should say for clustered subdivisions, like for green PUDs, you have to do this. For clustered right. subdivisions, you need to do this. It's just a tie in to what. Do, why is there even the. Uh, okay. Yeah, Do we need. It should be a separate. The, the addition of that? Cluster PUD map or something like that? Or yeah, you're, you're, you're going to tell people how you're going to do it. Calculations for open space and bonus density and all that stuff. Just think about it. Is it okay, Bruce? That makes sense, or okay? I think what or, I'll do is I'll actually add a couple of things there. I'll probably add so a description of the open space to be proposed for a clustered subdivision, its location and layout. It's okay. just tying back to all the, the other stuff. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Anything else on those two pages? I have on 25, kind of the, the section, new section 10, I think, do we eliminate the latter half of that sentence and any facilities to be included within the open space because we're not gonna have facilities? Oh, but in well, other PDs, PDs or What's that? In other PDs, you may have uh, other types of facilities. Yeah, but this is for clustered subdivisions. This language oh, is sorry, limited. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I see what you're saying. Well, it depends yeah. how you define facility, I guess. Well, you could have like a storm dispersion trench or something like that, which mm -hmm. might be a file swale. Storm is tourism, tourism's trench, rain garden, those are all. Okay, I took that as, uh, okay. Because I, I that, that was along the storm detention pond count. That, oh, yeah, yeah. It, see, that was getting rid of that seemed to be a consistent change. And any facilities as permitted to be included within the open yeah. space. Yeah, okay. Yeah. A little clarification. All right. Looks like we're down to the last couple pages here. Okay, looks like that's the conclusion of the findings then. Um, Could I make a suggestion? If, if we've just gone through the code, Bruce, you mentioned that you could probably figure out what changes need to be made to the findings based on what we just told you. Do we need to go, go through these? I'm seeing sh shaking heads. 
Okay. I'm, I'm and what I can do is, again, we're allowed to do this, but findings is it comes back as old business. Okay. And you're just reviewing the findings that you've basically authorized for this evening. Perfect. Yeah. Sounds great. And we'll just have one more careful read before it goes to council. There you go. That's exactly so what we're doing. Give him a copy. <laughs> so, okay, do I have a motion then? I move to close the public hearing on continued, or sorry, move the, I move to close the continued public hearing regarding the code amendments to implement a clustering mechanism within the Baca Municipal Code. One, one quick discussion before we vote. Uh, uh, Commissioner Zorn, your point on the tree designation for um, Norway Hill. Do we want to talk about that or are we just ignoring it? I think it's a reasonable fair discussion to have. Um, I think it, uh, you know, it, it, it deserves some addressing, um, but it just depends on uh, if people want to be talking about it. I, I, oh, go ahead. I don't know if we can put something in our findings that there was interest to apply a special zoning within that area due to the slide hazard and X, Y, Z. But adding it now is probably hard, but I, I don't want to totally ignore it. So I, it, it, it has if a very, it's something you're yeah, it has a very different, um, I think it, it, its differences are significant that we ought to address and acknowledge them. We have a, a, a heavier tree canopy that exists in that area I guess as opposed to the rest of Bothell. I guess I would like, there was a motion, oh, go ahead, Bruce. No, I, I was gonna say, go ahead and finish your motion, yeah, and then, well, you know, we're still in the same. Um, I guess the idea was that that is the type of work that would have to be done as part of a sub-area plan amendment, mm -hmm. not just a code amendment. It goes way beyond the scope of a code amendment. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, that'd be something, the kind of thing that we would actually take up with the council when we did our doc for this okay. call. Frank. Is that something that we could recommend that they look at down the road? I mean, yeah, but okay. again, probably kick it back to us. beyond the scope of what we're trying to do here, so <laughs> okay. but yes. So all those, in, uh, and actually just, okay, all those. Is there a second? Second. I think there, okay, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, with that, no study session, any old business? Reports from staff, reports from any members here? All right, uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you very much. That was awesome.